We're back for the afternoon of day 11 of the Alec Murdaugh double homicide trial. This morning was busy. Court is not back yet this afternoon. I lost track of time trying to figure out what shoes Alec Murdaugh was wearing when police interviewed him. I've seen a lot of you screenshotting it. I've got that video up and ready to go. We're going to look at it just real quick before court comes back in right now uh, without audio because I've slowed it way down. So I want to make sure that A, it doesn't sound funky, and B, we just take a look. It looks to me like he's wearing sneakers. Um, before the break, I was looking at some of the screenshots, and it looked like maybe he was wearing um, flip-flops. But again, those those photos are tough because they are like screenshots of a still of a video in a clear plastic sleeve, then re-photographed by somebody else in court. They are super awkward photos. So what I'm going to do is share this with y'all, and then we're going to roll the intro and get going. We are looking right by where the Law & Crime logo is. It's so frustrating that their logo is right where we need to see um, the shoes that he is wearing. Like, it's just, it's right where we need to be. But I took some screenshots of it. It looks to me like sneakers. We'll see what you guys think. I'm going to play it in slow-mo and pause the best I can. I've made this as big as I can, so I'm going to play it. As you see down here in the corner as he's getting out of the vehicle, and again, I've slowed this down so we can catch that shot of the shoe. I'll pull up the screenshot, but this is almost like a yellow and salmon and black trainer. It looks like a trainer, so that's what it looks like to me. Um, yep, yep, yep. So... Somebody's saying go on Law & Crime and see the non-logo video. I haven't seen that they put up the non-logo video, but I'll go take a look. But this, to me, looks like a trainer. That's It looks like a sneaker. So we'll see if there's much difference between whether he changed shoes or not. I don't. I think it's kind of a nothing if the prosecution doesn't have the other shoes, right? It's just a curiosity at this point. It sounds like court might be coming back, which means we're going to need to bring the intro before we bring the jury. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the Internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. Ding. Here, Juror 957 is worried about time. If the trial goes too long, and he mentioned three weeks as his limit. Juror 957 so has a time that issue. To my attention, and um, he's 729. Juror 729. So he's brought that to my attention, and um, and he's pondering the issue. So Are we going to be done? No. Just bring you all up to date on that issue. Counsel, ask them. Your Honor, ask them. Jury? No, ask them. I just want to raise one issue. All right. It doesn't relate to this witness, but the next group of witnesses the state intends to call relate to this blue rain jacket and that it was seized as a result of a search at the, at Ms. Libby Randolph's Murdoch's house and, and it was found in the closet. Uh, based on what what this witness had previously shared with law enforcement. Um, there's no evidence that we've been provided in discovery that that connects the defendant with this blue rain jacket. And so we'd move to exclude any evidence of the blue rain jacket unless they can represent to the court that they have any witness who connects the blue rain jacket with this defendant, Alec Murdoch. That's why the big Thank tarp you. in court. All right. Um, That's why the big tarping court. State. I don't think it was blue yet. What'd you say? She has identified a um, vinyl blue in that closet, which she says was consistent with what she saw Alex Murdoch coming into her house with. She said, yeah, that looks like it. Um, there's some questions that were asked by the defense, which I'm going to ask her about now. When she is asked about a shirt or something else, but she... I believe it's testified, yeah, that is consistent with the color and the vinyl she that I saw. She did that's testify in the to that. All right. Well, let's bring the jury. All right. We're going to bring the jury. 
Judge, you're gonna need a bigger bottle of water than that today, my guy. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a day. We are resuming. We are resuming court with the witness that was on the stand before lunch. The prosecution has presumably had the ability to watch the video. So we are resuming with Shelly Smith. Today is just, today feels like we're actually in a trial. I mean, it doesn't feel like anybody's asking the right types of questions. We still are having leading questions. If you are in law school, if you want to be an attorney, this is not a how to question a witness. This is more of a let's spot the one non-leading question amongst all of the leading questions. I also don't know what happened in Tom Girardi's hearing today, if it's happened yet. So if you ask me about other cases today, I apologize. I have no idea. I am in, I am, I am here with like blinders on with this case right now, but I will be looking at that after lunch. And then this week's Emily show podcast, for those of you new here, I have a podcast. I have two podcasts. All right, thank you. Two podcasts. You that may will be proceed, up Mr. Matters. So we will have Shelly Smith back on the stand. Did we find out the juror question? Yes. Do you remember being interviewed by Patrick? The juror question was, are we almost done yet? McDavid and Robert Purcell, Purcell that worked with Mr. Harpulian and Mr. Griffin interview. This in is October. On October 20th of 2022? Yes. And I believe Mr. Gris Griffin had asked you about some shoes in response to our questions. Do you remember telling them that he had, uh, these investigators, he had on some cloth-like shoes? Yes. Oh, good, he's at the podium, thank God. Stay there, counsel. Stay put. It's so much easier to focus. And I believe Mr. Um, Griffin asked you about the length of time you were there. Uh, do you remember these investigators asking you about the length of time that Mr. Murdahl was at Almeida the night of June 7th? Yes. Objection, Your Honor. Yes, sir. It's, he's offering a prior consistent statement, and no one's in. That's I don't know why. a speaking objection. You're impeaching her with it. You can't. That's a speaking objection. Bolster her testimony with prior consistent statement. That's also. What are the legal matters? Rounds. I believe he had questioned the uh, 30 or 40 minutes and he was did. questioning whether or not Alex asked her to say that. He did. Through their investigators, has clarified for me their conversations that directly contradict what she said early on direct. Rob, chat rules that apply. And I have through their questioning and interviews, which I just got Stark a little while is ago. Stark fine. Name calling and other rules are not. <laughs> Again, he, he's offering a prior consistent statement. And it's not admissible unless it's being offered to rebut a claim of recent fabrication. And that's not the situation we have here. We'll offer the entire statement right now. In objection to being entered into evidence. Yes, Your Honor. It's not a statement. There's a whole 30-minute audio recording. Yes. What are the legal grounds, uh, though? Uh, Rule 613B addresses this issue. Um, the court's like, you what I've got. The objection is overruled is the rule book and the grounds. And the judge was like, the grounds Mr. are Griffin asked you the length of time that Mr. Murdahl was there when these uh, investigators questioned you in October of 2022. Uh, do you remember them asking you about how long he was in the kitchen and in the room with Ms. Murdahl? Yes. And do you remember them asking you about and he asked you on, on cross whether it was unusual, Mr. whether Mr. Murdoch had visited that time of night. Do you remember that? Yes. He's giving preacher flair, and he can't help himself at this point. He's just like, he's ready. And do you remember telling the investigators that he would not come on this your This is all leading. After 8 o'clock, do you remember that? This is yes. all leading. And that that was unusual? Yes. All leading. All And do you remember one of them questioned you? You actually Jim could object to leading your he mind just hasn't. That something that this is unusual for him to be here that time of night. You remember that? Yes. Was your answer yeah? Because I was like yeah. To be honest, I was like oh why why are you here this time of night? Why are you here this time of night? You know? Because we all going to bed. 
That's mm -hmm. improper. Jim, you've got to object before the shit's out of the yes. horse. I just... Okay. Again, if the defense doesn't object, things that are improper happen. And things are just happening. They're just reading in her prior statements. He needs to just go with leading. Every time Jim is frustrated, he needs to just objection, leading, objection, leading, objection, leading. Reading her statements from a previous interview in at this point is improper. I'm interested in what she has to say as much as you are, but. And as far as the length of time, do you remember them asking you how long and you said it was about 20 minutes? Yes. She said that in her testimony today. So that is an improper prior consistent statement. You know what? I'm trying to speed this up. Maybe for some dogs. Rob said in the chat something about the court. I think the court has sustained every single leading objection that the defense has brought. If I was the defense at this point, I would object to every single question. The judge already isn't on your side. The defense knows that. The judge was already annoyed with some of Dick's shenanigans, but they have to Do protect you remember, their client. Um, Mr. When Mr. Griffin asked you about um, your recollection as to what Mr. Murdoch said you asked you about the 30 to 40 minute period, do you remember that? Remember yes. just a little while ago when he was asking you about that? I'm not trying to be. She answered. Just a little while ago. Listen. Yes. Okay. Um, about whether if anybody ever asked you if I was here or not? Yes. That's all leading. And do you remember that they, his investigators asked you if SLED had put that in your mind? No. What? Why are you introducing this? Is that the recollection or something? Why are we refreshing her recollection to something that's not helpful? He's leading the witness. He's publishing a document that is not a certified transcript of anything. Object. Leading. Mr. It's their statement. They took it. Let the court answer. I sustain the objection. Yes. Did Alex Murthal ask you to tell somebody how long he'd been there? That's a he good said question. someone asked you, I mean, 30 to 40 minutes, that's what he said. Thank he said you. somebody asked you. <laughs> yes. Objection, Just repeating her answer. <laughs> Objection, Your Honor, that's bad testimony Notice. for us. Bad. Is that the answer you gave his investigators? Yes. Back in October of 2020. Yes. That's not what she said in court. That's not what she said in court. That is proper. That is proper. Just stop asking questions, counsel. Just stop. If someone asks you, tell them I was here 30 to 40 minutes. Sit down. That's the question. And it, clarifying is not improper. Now, um, Mr. Um Griffin asked you They're about this now. blue tarp. Did his or Mr. Harpenden's investigators ask you about that when they met with you? Yes. Okay. Did they bring something with them? Do you remember them showing you something? No, a picture. Okay. Did they also show you a tarp? Yes. Okay. Did they tell you they just got it from Kmart? Yes. Okay. Just bought it from Kmart. Not Kmart. Oh God, not the tarp again. So they're, they're investigators brought this with you to the interview. Yes. And, and showed you this, correct? Yes. Right. And had you already described a um, well, where'd you first, who'd you first tell that there was a 
something that the defendant may have been holding his hand. Who did you tell first? When he, when he came in that morning after the funeral, who did you tell that first to in law enforcement? That the defendant may have been holding something or was holding something when he Dango. came in? Dango, Officer Dango. 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 Okay. Dango. And as a result of that, Slade, Slade came and interviewed you? Yes. Okay. And then you then told them what your testimony has been? Yes. Okay. Okay. So in October 22nd, when their investigators came, they were asking you about what you talked about to Dango, right? Yes. Okay. And they showed you this, right? Yes. And did they also ask you about if you've seen a shirt? Do you remember when they asked you if you've seen a blue shirt? Yes. Oh. It's a blue shirt. It's a blue shirt. Like a, like a well, I, don't, I don't know. What was it, a, just like a dress shirt or a shirt? What was it? Wait. Like what? A, um, like a rain jacket or something, like a pullover. Okay. Something. But they described it as a shirt? No. Not as I can recall. So there's a rain jacket and a tarp? What? She just said there's a rain jacket and a tarp. Oh my. Do you remember them asking you, you po you're positive it wasn't a shirt? Yes. They yes. asked you that? Yes. He is stressing me and out. And your answer was, it's vinyl. It was a vinyl, right? Yes, yes. Well, don't leave the witness. I don't know if they know how, Your Honor, honestly. This is, stre this is stress. I I'm stressed? Why am I stressed? I'm so stressed. The rain jacket could have been in the tarp. And Mr. Griffin was asking you about the... He needs the to slow down and take uh, a breath. Whatever. I need to slow down and take a breath. you remember them asking you if there could have been a gun in it, his investigators? I can't recall. I can't remember. <clears throat> she covered that on cross. I would have let that go. Because on cross, she said, I said it could have something in it. I would have, I wouldn't Last have tried to, to clarify that more. I would have just clarified the jacket issue. States 411, Ms. Shelley. I would have clarified the jacket. You've identified this previously. Does that look like the blue it. vinyl garment he was carrying in? Yes. Say that again. Yes. Sit down. Was it all crumbled up in his arms? He was balled up, yes. Was it up. folded out? No, it wasn't. Was he wearing it? No, he wasn't. That's all, thank you. All leading. By the defense. Oh. The most important Ms. statement Ms. Smith, after lunch was. Clear when you left the next me. morning, you saw the blue tarp laid out on Ms. Libby's retirement rocking chair correct yes and it was not a rain jacket was it no it wasn't it was a blue tarp like what's in here is as in evidence 86 right yes no doubt in your mind no doubt now our investigators let me ask you uh, mark for identification exhibit 87 did they show you a picture of this rain jacket yes had you ever and you and you told them you never seen that rain jacket, right? Correct. We've got Waterloo today. You know, I would introduce Exhibit 87 in Evans. I I think what the jury is going to take away is he asked her if somebody asked if I was here, say I was here 30 to 40 minutes. I think that's the most important testimony to come out of here. We'll see what happens with this rain jacket versus tarp nonsense. The jury might not even give a shit if it's a rain jacket or a tarp by the end of this because they're so damn you know, exhausting. While they're working on that, uh, Ms. Smith, did anyone speak to you over lunch about your testimony? No. Did you talk to any sled agents or anybody at the AG's office? No. Okay. Th that's a good question that the defense should always ask because you want to make sure that they haven't sat down with this witness and said, is that really what you remember or what have you? You want to make sure no one's interfering with this witness. So it's a good, fair question. I don't know what they're waiting for to come up, but woo. Um, if someone asks you, I was here, 
say I was here 30 to 40 minutes. If they had asked clearer questions at the beginning, I think they would have gotten into that during her direct examination. But they also got into him saying, you know, oh, I know, I know your boss over where you work. I know you've got a wedding coming up. Weddings can be expensive. Like, I've got you. That wasn't clear enough either. But we'll see how they argue it. I feel like we're going to get objections in closing on Miss State's testimony. And that nobody's going to know what to do because the testimony yeah, is so damn convoluted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, that statement was clear. If someone you asked you if I was here, rain was here jacket 30 to 40 minutes. Before? No. It took like an hour to get there. Did Alec Murdoch have that rain jacket with him when he came in to the um, Ms. Libby's home on the morning, I believe, a few days after the funeral? No. It looks exactly like a blue tarp on the and screen. It, if this photo could give it 41. She saw a crumpled 41. up blue things. <sighs> Can you there see this blue thing wadded up? Yes. If Can. that is, in fact, the photo of the rain jacket that we just looked at, would your testimony be you've never seen that garment folded up in that closet before? No, the only thing I seen was blue velvet. I didn't know if it was a raincoat or not. It was balled up. I don't know if it's a raincoat or not. It's so balled you, up. Well, well, have you ever been in this closet before? <laughs> no, I haven't. So you don't know what that is folded up there, do you? Oh, he's trying to fix it. Correct. And so... You can't fix it, Jim. If it's... She's not going to back down. If it's this rain jacket, if that's what's in that closet, you've never seen Alec Murdoch with... With what, with, with this garment before, have you? No, I haven't. All right. Karen, this is the point. I think the jurors are going to forget the 30 to 40 minute point after this whole blue tarp rain jacket mess. Yes. No. And that is strategic Just on the part briefly. of the defense. I know you've been, you've been really good here. And I know it's been For those hard of you that have said the defense is leading to, the defense the, is allowed um, to lead. It's cross. The defense that, is allowed to that lead. That day when you came to work, Mr. Randolph Murdoch had and been should. put back in the hospital. Isn't that correct? Yes. And that was unusual because he'd just gotten out of the hospital like a day before, right? Yes. And so it was, um, although it wasn't usual for Alec Murdoch to come over that night, but this was an unusual day because Ms. Randolph had been put back in the hospital. Would you Compound. agree with that? Yes. All right. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Here. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, you may step down. You are free to go. And she is like, thank you. God, I am off this witness stand right now. That was extreporous and a bit tedious. But you may call your next witness. The state calls Kristen Moore. She had some very good testimony. Uh, the state calls Kristen Moore. I'm going to wait and see how that's spelled. But I think Miss Shelley really had a lot of care for Alec Murdoch's parents. And you could see talking about Randolph made her sad. Back to police. Kristen Moore, M O O R E. So we're back to law enforcement witnesses. Um, could you tell the jurors where you work? I work for the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. And Agent Moore, you might need to pull that microphone a little to pick up so we can hear you, make sure to hear you out here. Thank you. And um, what do you do um, with SLED? I'm a special agent assigned to the crime scene unit. And um, did you have an occasion to become involved in the investigation of the murders of um, Paul and Maggie Murdoch? Yes, ma'am, I did. Um, were you involved in uh, the execution of a search warrant? Yes, ma'am. And where was that search warrant executed? at 2175 Yemassee Highway in Barnville, South Carolina. And um, do you know Mom's what um, that residence was or is? It was the residence of Alexander Murdaugh's mother. And um, who was there when you executed the search warrant? Several SLED agents were on scene as well as family members. What were you looking for when you searched the residence? 
We were advised that we were looking for a blue and color tarp like material. And what areas of the residence did you search? We searched the entire interior of the residence. What day? Oh yeah, the prosecutor's outfit is stunning. Um, let's talk about um, Her heels are very the north high. bedroom of that residence. Um, do you recall what you located in that bedroom? I appreciate the we prosecutor stays put. We located a blue tarp inside the closet in the north bedroom on the second floor. Is it a tarp or a raincoat? Well, at least the jury is going to have some answers about where it was located and how. Um, what they didn't ask is what day, because I have a feeling that this was after the September 11th accident. It would have to be after that because it was after that last witness, Shelly Smith, told law enforcement, oh, yeah, the night he came over <clears throat> after Randolph's funeral. God, I need a chart with yarn. Alec came over after Randolph's funeral with the blue bundle, but that wasn't disclosed to police until September 11th. 2021 so the search warrant wouldn't have been executed until after that 224 um do you recognize what's in that picture yes ma'am i do is that a fair and accurate representation of um, what you found in the north bedroom closet yes it is your honor this time the state would move states 224 into evidence well, that's just permission to publish yes. Okay. At least this attorney is not racing the at the speed of light. Jurors, <clears throat> what she found in that picture? That is the blue tarp that we located inside the bedroom in the north, inside the closet inside the bedroom. Okay. And um, what was that tarp located in? A storage container. Were there any items in the storage container? There were miscellaneous dishes underneath the tarp. Um, after you found the tarp, did you continue searching the residence? Yes, ma'am, we did. Okay. And what else did you find? Yes, please. We located a blue raincoat in the coat closet on the second floor. Okay. There were both. There's a tarp and a raincoat. Who knew? Tarp and raincoat why was this so confusing the defense knew there was a tarp and a raincoat which leads the point to karen's point earlier that the tarp raincoat bullshit nonsense just undermines alec asking this witness yes, to say i, I was here for 30 40 minutes well Lends credibility to the theory that the defense was just trying to make this a fucking circus sideshow to detract out, um, from the 30 to 40 minutes, and they succeeded because we've all been on their sideshow with them. Um, it is at the top of the photo on the right-hand side. So the door immediately above the stairs leads to an attic area, and the door to the right of it is the coat closet. So not this door right here at the very top of the stairs. The next door is the closet we're talking about. That's correct. About. And I'm going to show you states um, 414. Do you recognize that picture? Yes, ma'am, I do. Okay. And um, what are we looking at there? That is a picture of the interior of the coat closet. Okay. Your Honor, coat. this time I move states 414 into evidence. Coat closet. No, this sir. is not the Depp Heard trial. There is no coke closet. Coat, now, coat, could, jacket closet. Could you point out the blue raincoat? or tarp like material that you found in this picture. It's in the back of that photo behind the white box, towards the bottom. And if you don't mind, would you um, mind stepping down and pointing that out to the jurors? But again, the coat would you come down to the big tarp, <laughs> the prosecution. Thank you fell right into here. the coat tarp trap and the power of the he told me to say how long he was here so is a that's, little lost. that's how you found the raincoat yes ma'am it is down in that closet yes ma'am and if you look at this picture 
Um, it appears there are other items of clothing that are hanging up. Yes, ma'am, there was. But the rain coat is balled up down there. That is correct. And what did you do when you located that rain coat? We documented it with photographs and then we collected it in a brown paper bag, which was dated, sealed, and initialed. What date was this? I'm going to show you states um, 225, which I believe um, the defense has an objection to. Your, Your Honor, if it's the rain joke, Coat, it's the rain in joke. Evidence. Um, and the photo of the rain coat is in evidence. I don't know why we need another photo, but we do object to any testimony about <coughs> seizing the blue rain coat, anything You're beyond speaking. that, based upon my earlier um, statements to the court. No response. Um, Your Honor, um, this agent's testifying to what she retrieved from the closet, and um, I believe this is a picture of her retrieving that item. Objections overruled. So, Agent Moore, do you recognize what's in this picture? Yes, ma'am, I do. The state could have leaned into that. This is a true and accurate depiction of what you recovered more. from that closet. Yes, ma'am, it is. Your Honor, at this time I'll move states 225 into evidence. Objection. Same objection. Submit it over objection. All right, Agent Moore, if you could. The defense is still objecting, objecting that the raincoat is, is not tied to. This case. They want to keep the raincoat out. It's funny because they start objecting more when something's important. So you know how the defense feels about a piece of evidence when they start getting real loud and fussy. But the jury's probably caught on to that too. That is a photo of the blue raincoat that I collected. And the defense gets to argue who knows when that raincoat got there. The jury decides how much weight to give it. The defense gets to argue this is all overreaching. Without opening this, can you tell us? Um, Alex not wiggling nearly as much today. State's Exhibit 226. The raincoat. Based off of the item number and lab number and my initials, this would be the blue raincoat. Your Honor, um, the state removes states 226 into evidence. Because it's actual Objection evidence. Relevant. No response. Your Honor, this is the purported raincoat that was recovered from the closet. Objection. The defense is going to keep fighting to keep this raincoat out. And when you they say heard, that the witness um, is not tied it to coat, the scene. What did you did you do anything with it besides photograph and collect it? Not on that day. We transported it back to the Sled Forensic Services Laboratory. And now in the closet where you found that raincoat, were there any guns? No, ma'am. This raincoat is covered in GSR. Were you involved in any of According the processing the of the raincoat? Opening. Yes, ma'am, I was. And what part were you involved in? On October 7th, 2021, at the SLED Forensic Services Laboratory, um, I met with SLED serology personnel to document and to do additional processing on the raincoat. Okay. And what processing did you take part in? It was documented with photographs. The stains on the raincoat were then documented with scale stains? tape and labeled. Photographed again. Stains. Sled serology department then tested the stains with phenolphthalein, which what is stains? a presumptive test for the presence of suspected blood. What stains? All testing by, with phenolphthalein was negative. We then used an alternate light source to look for any latent stains on the raincoat. We observed an additional stain and documented it with photographs as well as scaled it. Then it was tested with phenolphthalein as well, and it was negative. We then used leucocrystal violet or LCV, which is also a presumptive test for the presence of suspected blood, and it was negative also. All right, as far as your involvement in the raincoat, does that pretty much sum it up for us? Yes, ma'am, it does. All the stains were negative All for right, blood. All right, thank you, Agent Moore. Please answer any questions from the defense. So all the stains on the raincoat, raincoat were negative for blood. Good afternoon, Agent Moore. Good afternoon. This is not the agent that tested it for gunshot the, right um, So I understand you went to Almeida. Is that good or bad? It just, it, it just is. To execute a search warrant. Is that correct? Yes, sir. What is. date? And what was the day? September? September 16th, 2021. Thank you for September asking. 16th, 2021. And you're looking for a blue tarp. 
We were advised that we were searching for a blue tarp-like material. Okay, and you found a blue tarp, is that right? Yes, sir. And in that blue tarp, there were dishes wrapped up in that blue tarp, right? No, sir, no dishes were wrapped in the blue tarp. It was folded on top of the dishes. Okay, so you seized the blue tarp, right? Yes, sir. And did you do any um, testing of the blue tarp to see if there was blood? No, sir, I did not do any testing on the blue tarp. You Why not bring up the DSR? Because this witness tarp. didn't do it. I am unaware of any testing done on the blue tarp. This witness didn't test you, for you DSR. You this rain jacket That's why. in here, in this box. Is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. And um, well, we opened the box. Why didn't we open the box? Does the rain jacket look like a tarp? And back like in the lab, uh, you did some presumptive testing. We sprayed it with phenol first. Phenol phthalene was first utilized, yes, sir. And phenolphthalein uh, is a presumptive test for blood, meaning, you know, it, it could test positive, but it's not necessarily means it's blood, right? That is correct. But it didn't. And in order to determine whether something that has tested positive with phenolphthalein, you, you do another type of test to confirm human blood, right? That is correct. But the blue rain jacket never tested positive for the presumptive test using phenol phalene, right? That is correct. So it was negative? Yes, sir. So after getting negative with phenol, then you use another product called LCV. Is that right? We did. We used an alternate light source first to make sure that we had all stains documented. Now, an alternate light source is, is what? It is a specific wavelength of a flashlight and you use a colored filter and then you can see any latent things that you wouldn't be able to see with your naked eye. And, and the alternative light source doesn't tell you whether that's possibly blood or something else, does it? No, sir, it does not. So you use that alternative light source and you identify some area and is that the area you tested with LCV? We tested the entire raincoat with LCV. The entire raincoat. Okay. Yes, sir. And again, that's a presumptive test like phenolphthalein. Yes, sir. And that tested negative? That is correct. Okay. And um, so there's no more blood testing done of the rain jacket, right? I was not involved in any further processing of the raincoat. Do you know if that LCV that you sprayed on the entire shirt has turned the rain jacket in that box completely violent? I have not seen the raincoat since the processing was done on October 7th, 2021. Okay. What size is this rain jacket? I could not tell you the exact size of the raincoat. Well, would you agree with me that the records indicate it's a large? Yes, sir, it is a larger jacket. Well, the size being large, do you know if it's large? If that's the size? I do not recall the size. Do you mind if she opens it up? Your Honor, uh, do you mind if the witness opens the box up? Let's see what size the rain jacket is. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. I have scissors. You have scissors? No, I don't have scissors. I have gloves. Yeah. Good. I'm glad they're opening it. I'm glad they're opening it. Let's look at it. Let's look at the raincoat. The raincoat, the relevance of the raincoat is in opening statements. The prosecution said, good, she put on gloves. That's so helpful. Um, the prosecution said that the raincoat had gunshot residue all over it. Tons and tons of gunshot residue. So here we are. Now, if this raincoat looks tarpy, if it is tarp-like material, I don't know why the defense is doing this. If this is clearly not tarp-like material, then I can understand why the defense is doing this. But 
the thing that's different in this case, and I see a lot of comments about the O.J. Simpson case, the thing that's different is that no one's alleging Alec wore this. It's It seems like they're alleging he wrapped things in it to bring them or get rid of them or, or dispose of them. But with all the woods and stuff, why not just ditch it? Why hide it in his mom's closet? It's odd. All of it's odd. But I want to see the raincoat just as much as y'all do. The unboxings on this is so funny. I mean, let's just take... Oh, damn it, we're already here, Jim. Let's just take a look at the raincoat. I'm glad he asked. Somebody had to. Somebody had to show us the raincoat. Like, why not? There was a smokehouse. Kay's like, you could have burned this very easily. There's a smokehouse on the property. And he's... I mean... It's just... It's just odd. It's just odd. All of this is odd. I don't know what Jim's crack was. It's like a box and a box and a box and a box. But I would love to see the raincoat and how tarpy it is. It looks kind of tarpy in the pictures that we can see. I mean, we can see the pictures down over here, right on that screen. It looks tarpish, tarp-like. There's a smokehouse on the mom's property. <laughs> the jury laughing is the greatest thing ever, that it is wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped. Jim just said, like my house on Christmas morning. Um, wait, there's a smokehouse on the property. What's the first thing that makes me all jealous of these places? That's on the parents' property. There's a smokehouse. Question, people shoot wearing coats all the time. How can you tell who, when, or where the coat was worn? Exactly right. They're trying to tie it to him walking in the door with it and the last witness seeing it. The final twist is it's not actually in there at all. Or that it's not very big, and maybe that's what the defense is thinking that it's really not big enough to look like a bundled up tarp. Well, that looks tarp-like. Tell us what size it is, please. Yes, sir. I mean... It looks tarp-like to me. I don't see a tag. I don't see a tag right here at the front. I mean, it's it's big. It's long. It's strong. It's down to get the friction on. You may want to put gloves on. It has chemicals on it. Ooh, I don't want to touch it then, which I just did. Okay. Well, do you mind standing up in front of the jury and, and show them how large it is? To all of our ears. That's not small. And the defense would have known that it's not small. Like, it's is it, it is it a poncho style rain jacket? It's tarp like. Just sure it appears that way. Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> that doesn't look poncho to me, it's got arms. But it's tarp like. I appreciate that she corrected him and said you're gonna want gloves that got chemicals on it. The jury's never touching that. It looks it looks similar to the tarp. It's okay, so the rain jacket's tarp like. Great! The redirect needs to be, would you call that a tarp like material? You know if that rain yes. jacket or photos of that rain jacket was shown to any member of the Murdoch family to see if they recognized it? I am unsure. Okay. You did not then, did you? No, sir, I did not. Did you show the, that photo or a picture, excuse me, 
the photograph, the rain jacket. Let me scratch that. Did you show to Shelly Smith the rain jacket or a photo of the rain jacket? No, sir, I did not. Do you know of any sled agent who did? I do not. She's the crime scene. One second, girl. She recovered the evidence and tested the evidence for the presence of blood. That's it. I wonder if they think the prosecution is going to argue that Alec was wearing that over his clothes and that's why he didn't have any blood on him. I don't think that's necessarily what they need to argue. But now we've gone an entire day arguing over a tarp and a rain jacket to learn Sled recovered both a tarp and a rain jacket. And the jury's got to be like, there's both? That's all the questions I have. Great. Further questions. Is it tarp like and then sit down? I only brought this. Okay. It looks like a tarp to me. I think it looks like a tarp to y'all. Y'all put a one in the chat if it looks like a tarp to you. Oh, the prosecutor's gonna pick it up. Honey, no. You've got such a great suit on. It's got right, it's got more. What happened to that tarp? All kinds of chemicals on it. Raincoat. Where is it? It's in the Yes, ma'am. Your suit is so white. Don't touch, don't touch the chemical, don't touch the chemical covered raincoat and your glorious white suit. I'm nervous. Uh, States Exhibit 226. This is the raincoat you collected from. I like that they let the defense make them open that it. That closet in Alameda? Yes, ma'am, it play. is. Now, when you collected it, did it have like this tape here on the raincoat? Good question. Where we can, you know, the white tape with the letters on there? No, ma'am, I placed that on that. Why? So that was done during processing? Yes, ma'am, it was. Good question. And we've been talking about a raincoat, but this isn't, is this what you would normally think a raincoat would look like? No, ma'am. This is rather large for a raincoat? Yes, ma'am. When we found it, it was balled up like this. That is correct. This is this is good questioning. This, no prosecu for this, this, one. this prosecutor won the day right now. Get it, girl. Asking about the tape was a big deal because the Thank tape. Thank you. You may step down. The tape not being there makes it even more tarp-like. Those are the tape marks where they were lining out any stains that they saw on it. That was probably one of the best witness examinations we've seen this trial. Call your next witness. Oh. William McElby. That was a good redirect. Oh my God, there's so much bumping and thumping going on in this courtroom. Um, he's going the distance. He's going for speed. Sorry, it was the bumping and thumping. That, that got me there. That prosecutor did a very good job. She should have questioned Miss Shelley. She absolutely should have questioned Miss Shelley. We affirm the testimony that shall be the truth. So have you gone? Take a seat in the witness. Okay, I was busy making song lyric jokes and I didn't pay attention to who this was. Not law enforcement. My name is William McElveen, uh, M C E L V E E N. Mr. McElveen, how are you doing today? Doing well, how are you? Doing well. Um, if you would tell the jury a little bit about yourself. Uh, where'd you grow up and uh, where'd you go to school? Uh, I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. Tell me about your mom um, and them. Went to AC Floor High School. Went to uh, the Citadel after high school. Um, graduated there in 2017. Went to get my master's at Clemson. Graduated in 2018. Um, moved back to Charleston, worked for a CPA firm for a while. And now I'm in finance for a home builder. For where, sorry? For a home building company. And uh, where do you, what area generally do you currently live? I live in Charleston now. Um, huh. Mr. McElveen, you, uh, were you friends with Paul Murdoch? I was. That's friends. why he's here. All right, well, tell us a little bit about when you all first met. Um, so I lived in Esdo Beach every summer with my granddad. And ah, uh, when our, I was growing up, our granddaddy's and he had beach houses next to all the time, time. So we just became close. Edisto's a small town. Uh, not many young people live there, so the young people kind of stick together. 
Uh, we both love fishing, hanging out, so we just get, became good friends through that. So you would you would spend the summers in Edisto? That's correct. Yep. And what kind of things would you do throughout those summers? Um, just hang out, work, fish. What kind of jobs did you get? I uh, worked multiple jobs there for five-ish summers. Um, worked at the marina a good bit, a restaurant there called the Sea Cow. Um, I worked at a realty company as an inspector and uh, at the bylo as well. I don't know if this is Will's. And I think you just said that you Because Will's, about I think, was Chapman. Years. That's correct. Okay. Um, tell us a little about your friendship. How did it, uh, how did it start and how did it kind of evolve? Uh, it started was all just old fucks at the beach. interest in fishing and hanging out. Um, and then he was just, just a really fun guy. So we just hung out more and more. Um, and I started going to Moselle, um, hanging out with his whole family. Uh, they kind of took me in and, um, and just evolved from there. Yeah. So did you get to know him pretty well? Yes, I did. Did you get to know his family fairly well? Yes, I did. Um, tell us a little bit about Paul. Uh, Paul was just a really fun guy, just like the life of the party kind of guy. Um, everybody that really knew him loved him. Um, I don't know, just a great guy, very loyal friend, kind of, the kind of guy that's always there when you need him. So he was, if you reached out and needed something, he... Sure you pull that mic a little closer to your mouth. Yep, the defendant is back to uh, bobbing. Let's try to speak into the microphone. Okay. Um, so was he a, sort of a responsive friend, meaning if you reached out to him, would he respond back? Yes, he was very responsive. And how did you primarily communicate with them? What what means? Um, These are cell phone normally. Yeah. Direct phone questions. calls or texts. A little not bit both, but mostly phone calls. Not he was leading. a big phone caller. Yes. Well, I guess that. Tell us a little bit about Paul's cell phone use. Did he did he like to use his cell phone? He did like his cell phone. How would you describe it? His Let use of cell phone. Um, he used cell phone a lot. Like, kind of every time he had a road trip or anything like that, he would. Um, use it to call all of his friends and just check in on everybody. Um, I, mean, I can speak for almost all of his friends. We get a phone call from him almost every day. Um, and then we use text a lot, Snapchat, that kind of stuff. Was he on his phone quite a bit? Yes. To the point where it was, was it very noticeable to his friends? Uh, yes. Sir, we're young, we use our phones. <laughs> Did you... Uh Ever have a chance? Did you have an opportunity to get to know Maggie Myrtle? Yes, I did. All right. Well, tell us about her. What was your observations about her or your uh, the, whatever friendship y'all had? Uh, she was just a super sweet lady. Um, she kind of always trusted Paul when he was with me. Um, she would know he's staying out of trouble. Um, I don't know, she just treated all of Paul's friends like they were her kids, and just a very nice lady. And did she approve of you hanging out with Paul? Yes. Okay. Tell us about that. About what? Sorry. Well, did she did she ever comment to you about how she liked you hanging out with Paul? Yeah, yeah, she did. Like hanging out with Paul. And did you have an opportunity to get to know um, Alex Murdo? I did. All right. And uh, what were your perceptions of him? Um, kind of same way the rest of the family just took everybody in, all Paul's friends. Um, he was kind of the the dad of all of our friend group. Um, same way the rest of the family, yeah. And uh, is he here today? Yes. Did you identify him? Yes. It's in the brown jacket. Thank you. Did you ever get to go out to the family property on Moselle? Yes, I did. Um, how often would you have, have you been out there visiting? Um, probably 30 or 40 times. Okay. Did you spend the night when you went out there? Yes. Online. Tell us a little bit about the property. What kind of things would y'all do out there? Um, did a lot of hunting. Also, probably more than hunting, just hanging out. Um, just, just enjoying each other's company, hanging out. So you said about what, 30, 30 to 40? Is that what you said? That's correct. Okay. If you would, please pick yep. up a little bit. It's okay. All right, now that the property, was there a, um, 
Was there a main house location? Does the Citadel uh, have rings was, like yes. MIT does? Uh, was there a secondary that's location what that looked like. for uh, kennels in a, in a shed? Yes, there was. All right. Did you spend much time out at that secondary location? A uh, good bit, yeah. All right. Describe that area for us, if you would. What was, what was out there, and what would you do out there? Um, so it's like a big shed hangar that side comes up. We'd all hang out over there. Um, and there's the dog kennels. And then um, a few years back, they built the shed across from the hangar. And uh, it was just a good place to get away from the main house and just hang out. And I noticed when he was moving the mic. Talk. If you all were I'm visiting, waiting to see how it all connects. Moselle, and I got distracted. Would you spend your time hanging around at that, at that shed, the hangar area? Oh, no, I knew what the citadel uh, it was. Depends. For, I just for didn't large groups, we would have people over there. If there was jewelry involved. If it was just me and Paul and the family would just hang out in the house. Like MIT grads, I um, figured that the rings kennels, are... Um, were there a number of dogs on the property? Um, Part of it. There were, yes. Okay, did you, do you remember them? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, tell Who's us about Bubba? the dogs you remembered. And, and what, well, first of all, were there kind of sep two different kinds what? of dogs? Between family dogs or working dogs? Yes. That's leading. Okay. But what? Did you get to know any of the family dogs? Yes. Who, who were they? Tell us about those dogs. Uh, Bubba is a yellow lab, um, and then Bourbon, brown lab, and Grady is a black lab. And they were Bubba, Bourbon, and all Grady. pretty uh, relaxed, would hang out around the house mostly, but um, I don't know. They were just good dogs. Did they, uh, and when you slept over there, did, they, did the dogs sleep at the house location, the main house? Uh, yes. Thanks, y'all, for satisfying my... The, ADHD the uh, family dogs did. The, the family dogs. Yes. And then there were some working dogs that, would, where would they stay, the working mm -hmm. dogs? They would stay in the kennels by the shed. Um, yes, the location. So uh, the Mazel location, when you, when you started going there, did it have one or two entrances and exits? Uh, two entrances. Okay. Next. And describe Very the smart entrances. of Jim. Do you see how um, he's holding so up? So one was the main entrance. Holding that was, up uh, his notepad to had talk a to Alec. Pillar outside. Very aware of um, Jim. And that would just kind of go to the house and not really pass anything, go through some trees. The other entrance would be uh, next to the cabin, right behind the shed. Um, and that entrance can kind of go multiple ways when you go in there, but um, that passes by the cabin and. and um, the sheds and then goes to the house as well. So there's yeah, a what, cabin. Would that entrance on the is that where the um, the mailbox was located? Oh, I can't remember the mailbox is. I believe those at the pillars at the main entrance, maybe. Is that the location near the dog kennels? That second exit. Yes, yes. Kennels? Was there um, one exit that was used more often than the other? Um. We probably more often use the one by the sheds. Have you ever, if there was ever a time where someone was leaving the house and you all were down at the kennels, what was the normal course of action for that person, whether it was... They're trying Mr. to establish driving in and out of Moselle, I think. Um, can I say that again? If anyone was leaving the house or coming back and you all were down at the shed area, the kennel area, what was the normal course of action for Mr. or Mrs. Murdoff if, if they were leaving the house and, and, and exiting and you were down there? Um, typically, they would come check on us um, and drive by and just say, hey. But that was normal? I would say it's normal, yes. This is why. Did you, um, with Paul, were you guys close enough where you shared your location with each other? We did. Find my Tell us what that means. Oh. Is, is this an iPhone? Yeah, it's uh, the app on Find My Friends on iPhone. And uh, what does it mean to actually share your location with someone? Just That's means at any point deal. in time you can open your phone and see where all your friends are and pinpoint their exact location. <clears throat> did you do that with many people? Uh, probably no. five or ten. Do you know if Paul did that with many people? Don't think Paul did with many people, no. Very interesting. When you spent time down at the uh, hangar and the kennels, um, was it common for firearms to be stored down there or left down there? Uh, not common, no. 
in those times you said you've been about there about 30 to 40 times did you I mean how would you explain common was it was it something that you frequently see or not frequently I can't remember a time I've seen fire on the left at the sheds this is going against the defense's argument that Paul would just leave guns when everywhere. Was the last time you uh, saw was Paul Murdoch? Um, June 5th, I think, two days before. That weekend before yes. Monday? Yes. Yes. Tell us about that weekend. I um, can't remember much. We were hanging out at my friend's houses. Um, I think we went to a bar called the Wind Jammer in Charleston. Uh, but I don't remember much from the weekend. Did you see? Uh, did you see him on Sunday? <clears throat> Do not think I saw him on Sunday. No. Did he stay at your house that weekend? I don't think so. My friends and I were talking about that. We can't remember if it was my house or someone one of my other friends' houses. Would Would Paul commonly stay at when he was visiting Charleston? Would he Would he crash at people's houses? Yes, he normally stayed at our house. But you don't remember if that particular time you did or not? Don't remember. How were you uh, kind of told about the murders? How did you find out? Um, so I missed a few calls in the middle of the night that I didn't wake up to. Um, the next morning, my roommate came to my room and told me. OK. Who's your roommate? Wait. Your roommate is here. Thank you. Uh, Frank Chapman. Is he related to and, Will's uh, Chapman? he told you what happened? Yes. Did you make it out to the property at all? Uh, yes, the next day I went out to the property. So the 8th of June? Yes. And walk us through what, what happened out there when you made it to the property. Where did you go? Uh, we just went to the main house and uh, just went to see the family and to be with everybody. A lot of friends and family were, were there? Good bit of friends and family, yes. Being a witness is hard. Did you so, attend the funeral as well? Being a witness is hard. I did, yes. He could ask for water if he wanted. He didn't. Being a witness is hard. Thank you, court's indulgence. All right. Being a witness is hard. And so I'm not going to comment on his demeanor anymore. Being a witness is hard. He's testifying about one of his dear friends being murdered. Well, the friend's father, who he spent a considerable amount of time with, is charged with doing it. This has to be awkward, emotional difficult, frustrating, confusing, especially depending on what this young man feels about whether or not Alec Murdoch murdered his friend. So That's I needed to understand more about the there he's got water. I needed to understand more about the phone location because they didn't afternoon. tie afternoon. it around. Paul Murdaugh was this this witness's age. Paul Murdaugh was Mr. McElveen, wh is where are you from? Alex's is, son. Uh, from Columbia, South Carolina. And are you friends with Wills Chapman and Frank Chapman and Will Loving and I am, yes. That, that crowd? Okay. That and crowd. Um, and so you met with Paul, I take it, down at Edisto with with the Columbia group? Yep. And and you became really good friends of Paul's, correct? Correct. And I think you described him as a loyal friend, did you not? Correct. Um, and you became close not only to Paul, but to to the entire uh, Murdoch family, right? Correct. You know, there, there, there are houses that kids, teenagers, young adults congregate at their parents' house. Was the Murdoch house at Edisto one of those houses where people would congregate? Clearly. It was, yes. And, uh, and you spent a lot of time at Edisto there I, in the I summers? I did, yes. And you spent time around Alec and Paul and Buster and Maggie, is that correct? That's correct. And, and how would you describe Alec's relationship with Paul? Um, they had a very good relationship. Um, they were kind of best friends in a way. They were close? Very close. And how, from your observation, how would you describe Alec's relationship with Maggie? Um, from everything I've seen, it was great too. I mean, nothing. I've never seen anything negative. Right. Did you know he was stealing and, from his um, clients? And they, that's what the going to ask. For Paul to be to 
hang around with you and right that's correct i mean i, I think you were asked about that you're very responsible young um, man you strike me as someone who's very responsible did they, they did they like that about you you think they did i think so and you strike me as someone who who if you're down at moselle would not leave guns laying around you wouldn't do that would you probably not no, sir. okay so when you were with paul you know hunting you were responsible enough to be sure that guns got put away properly correct correct um you were uh, ask about some of their dogs um actually paul had a puppy did he know <coughs> he did you have that puppy now i do what's his name his name's goose how's he doing he's doing great <coughs> glad to hear that any questions the, um, and you describe uh three labs <coughs> bubba the yellow lab burden the Brown Lab and Grady, the Black Lab. That's correct. And and when you were at Mazell, I mean, these were the, these were family dogs, and they stayed up at the at the residence. That's right. Now, at the residence, they had a, a invisible electric fence around the house. Correct. Uh, I didn't know about it, but possibly so. Okay. Well, was Bubba um, was Bubba a handful? That just take off sometimes. Uh, sometimes, right. And, and you don't know um, when was the last time you were, you were at Moselle? Mm, I can't remember. Was it in 2021? Most likely. Okay. For those of you saying this is all were the leading, dogs there? the defense is allowed to lead. I can't remember. The defense is allowed to lead its cross-examination. It's totally fine. When you um, heard that Paul had been murdered, uh, did, did did Will Loving come down to, to, to your house in Charleston, or was it another friend's house? Uh, Will went to another friend's, but I think he came to our house later in the day. Um, but we had a group at our house as well. <laughs> and then you went to Moselle? Um, then the next day we went to Moselle. Has that been on that Wednesday? The murders uh, were Monday night, you know, late. So yes, I guess that Wednesday we went to Moselle. So not, not the Tuesday, but the Wednesday. I believe that's correct. And who all went with you? Um, I think Frank Chapman went with me. And that might be it. Okay. And who was there when you got there? Well, were any other, Paul, any of any other friends of Paul there when you got um, there? Rogan was there and Nolan was there. Um, and what was there might have a couple more, but I'm not sure. Ah! Okay. What was Alec Murdoch's demeanor when you saw him? I'm um, just sad, crying. Did y'all hug? We did hug, yeah. You mean, did he? I'm gonna ask if he cried? He was crying. Yes. And did you go back over to Moselle after the funeral? Uh, yes, I did. And were there a bunch of Paul's friends there? There were, yes. And can you tell me, was Alec, uh, was he still crying, hugging all the Paul's he, friends? He was still crying. I mean, there, there were so many people there that it was kind of a line to see him, but from the little bit I saw him, yes. Yeah. One second, Your Honor. I think the point of this well, witness. Further. <coughs> anything further? Thank you. You must step down. I think the point of this witness for the cross examination was to show that the, it was common. Break. Uh, addressing the jury. 15 minutes break. <laughs> it was common practice for Ellick to drive out past the kennels when he left Moselle. I think that was the entire point of that witness was to show that they would drive out that way. 
So if the court takes a break, I'm just going to keep looking at this in case the court says anything when they come back. I don't know what they're going to decide to do about the juror that has a timing issue. They might just excuse that juror and replace them with an alternate. The juror is now worried that this will go beyond three weeks. All of us are. All of us are. Juror 729, we're with you. We agree. There is large concern that this is going to go beyond three weeks. I'm going to answer some questions while the court is on a break and we'll go from there. All right. Let's let's just let's just answer some questions. I know there's lots of them. It's Kristen Campbell in the chat says and the phone location, they brought it up, but it was a nothing. They they asked a lot of questions, but the only point I think they made was that they would drive uh the other way. Okay. They would drive the other way. Great. So I wonder who we will see this afternoon. Um, AM went to the smokehouse. Did he burn evidence? I don't know. Not the raincoat that, or the tarp or whatever. <sighs> um, Mand Nam says, incredibly shady of defense, knew there was a tarp. That, I don't see it as shady. I don't see it as fuckery. That's defense being defense. Truly, I mean, maybe it's just because I've done a lot of trials, but that's the defense being the defense. They're making an issue out of nothing to detract from the other issue, which is that Alec Murdoch apparently asked a witness to say, if anyone asks you, I was here 30 to 40 minutes, right? Not 15 to 20, 30 to 40. I was here longer. But the cell phone evidence is going to make clear how long Alec was where he was, and so is his car. But him asking a witness to say that he was there longer goes more towards the prosecution being able to argue consciousness of guilt. So I don't see it as shady. That is the defense attorney being the defense attorney who brings a big blue bundled up tarp to a sick mother and leaves it open upstairs. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Shannon said, I mean, do we know the coat was his who wore it? How long was it in the closet? Had it been while hunting, et cetera, previously? We don't know. What we know is that that witness saw him come in with a big blue bundle after his dad's funeral, and two things were taken out of the house that were blue and tarp-like, and one of them tested for gunshot residue that was bundled up and tramped down into the bottom of the closet and not hung in the coat closet like the rest of the things that were hung. What's the purpose of that witness? I think it was the driveway. Will Alec take the stand? My guess is as good as yours, but... If I had to, if I had to, if I had to say that today, it's no. There is no need for Alec Murdoch at this point to take the stand, and there's no good that can come out of it. I think that the defense so far has this jury a bit confused. I don't think the prosecution has been super clear, and I think he's going to get himself in more trouble um, if he tries to testify. But we're going to have to see the rest of the evidence come in, won't we? But no, I don't think Alec Murdoch testifies. Why is Dick having Jim take more witnesses now? This might have always been their plan. They might have divided up the witnesses before the trial started. Or it might be because Dick is obviously pissing off the judge. It might be that too. When does the defense call their witnesses? After the prosecution's case in chief. So for those of you new to criminal trials and trials in the United States, the prosecution bears the burden of proof. Their case goes first. The prosecution ends their case in chief when they get to the end of the witnesses, and then there will be a motion to dismiss, likely. Um, the judge will hear that motion to dismiss. It likely won't get dismissed, but we'll see. We are not there yet. So there will be prosecution case in chief, motion to dismiss. Then there will be the defense case, and then the prosecution's rebuttal case, and then closing arguments. So case in chief prosecution, motion, case in chief defense, rebuttal, closing. That's where we're at. How we get to the end by the end of this week, I do not know. I don't see I don't see a path where we're done with this this week at all. I don't see a path with that at all. So no, I don't think Alec takes the stand. Um that's interesting testimony. Paul and AM were like best friend. Teeny Elephant, I grabbed this because in Alec's first interview when he was talking about the threats Paul was receiving because of the boat case, what he said were, I don't think Paul tells me everything. I don't think he tells me. I think they're keeping 
how bad it is for me. But then we heard Paul's other friends testify, eh, the threats really weren't anything serious. It was more people saying stuff online. So it's interesting to hear other friends' perception of, oh, well, they were like best friends. If they were like best friends, why is Alex thought my son doesn't tell me everything? It's just an int it's an interesting uh, inconsistency, and it's different because this witness's testimony is much different than the Will that test Will Chapman, who testified and basically said Paul was the apple of Alex's eye, and Maggie liked to mess around with the dogs and all of that. It's very different. The prosecution is giving. Jurors and all of us, whiplash, ooh, squirrel, please connect the dots. They are definitely not connecting the dots. And they can't connect all of them. But they can start connecting some of them. And I hope that they do a better job with that. Laura said Tony Soprano also went to his mom and hid his gun at his dementia-ridden mother's house. Maybe he's a fan of the show. I don't even remember the Sopranos that well. Um, so that's a very fair point. Couldn't the defense say that he had worn it hunting and that's why it had GSR on it? I don't even think the defense needs to do that. I think the defense needs to do, who the hell knows how that got into the closet or when it's been there. But the defense fought so hard to keep it out. They fought so hard to keep it out in front of the jury that they've got to talk about it, you know? Um, Emily, your quote of the day for me is, it's an interesting inconsistency. Now try to remember what part of the day made you say that because it is globally applicable. <laughs> I, can't, I probably said it more than once today, but it's a very fair point, Rob. There's some very interesting inconsistencies here. Um, this is from earlier. Why is he yelling at her? I don't know. Some of the prosecution questioning has really left me scratching my head. It's why I'm wearing a hat today to try to stop. We need an objection. Mercy. Yes, we do. Like, objection, Your Honor. Please make it stop. Please make it stop. Um, can improper statements questioning be grounds for appeal if the defense doesn't properly object? No. If the defense doesn't properly object, the grounds for appeal are ineffective assistance of counsel. So, um, by the book, good old boys think their voice is the most important reason for speaking objections and major leading can't help themselves. I don't know about that, but it's been very frustrating. And the speaking objections have continued and the judge has not reminded them again today, but I'm sure they will. EDB, look at Alex's interrogation night of the murders. At the end, you can see he has on sneakers. We definitely saw that at the very beginning today. And we can actually go look at, oh, uh, we can go look at that again real quick since we kind of cut it off. But I, we looked at that right at the end um, here with those shoes. So for those of you that have joined since earlier today, Alex mother's, caregiver Shelly testified he had on like a boat shoe like a cloth shoe um when he came over to her house that was her her remembrance of when he came over to his mother's house but when the police are interviewing him later and he's getting out of the car we can clearly see that he is wearing like a yellow and orange it looks like a yellow and orange trainer um how much the jury will focus on that I don't know is it an inconsistency in that witness's testimony is it an inconsistent remembrance or did he change shoes? I think, again, with everything in this case, it could go either way. It depends on the jury. Question, Judge Darrow did not, uh, wait, question, Judge Darrow, but I keep wondering how he who does not consent to be named Daryl Brooks would fare against the judge. Not well. Um, could Judge Strip right to represent himself uh, we talked about that a lot during that case. It's different judges are different, but in Minnesota, it didn't seem like that was, a, or in Wisconsin, I'm sorry, that didn't seem like it was a possibility. Did we learn why juror 29 needed to talk? Yes. Juror 729 said that they had three weeks available and juror 729 is not confident that this shit's going to be done in, in three weeks. That's not what the court said, but what the court said right at the beginning was, that that juror was only available for three weeks and was questioning whether they would be done, it seemed. Um, what is in Alex's back pocket at as he's exiting the vehicle? I don't know. Let's go look. Good question. Let's go look together. I've slowed this down so we can see. Um, it looks like his pocket is flapped up. I don't know. Because then we get all of this on top of it. So we'll have to go find one that rolls right through to the end. I don't think it's another phone, 
but there it looks like there's something in his pocket. It could be his wallet. Um, it could be his wallet. So we'll see. I'm gonna try to let's see. Let's see if we can let's see if we can zoom zoom as he's getting out of the car again. Everybody's shaking hands. Great. We see the sneakers. I mean, could be a wallet. Could be a wallet. So not sure. I would need I would need the um the video without all the all the stuff. But it looks like it looks like it could be a wallet. If it was another phone, they might have asked. Again, then again, they might not have. Could this juror be dismissed due to their three-week time limit? Yes, they could be dismissed. And then an alternate would serve in their place. That's why they have a bunch. Emily, you can see the shoe better after he's out. Don't stop watching on the Alec interrogation. It's clear he's wearing sneakers. Um, yes, it is good to see as he's getting out. Do the liens and debts in Maggie's name go away after her death? It depends, unfortunately. It depends. If they are just in her name, if they're marital property. So that's kind of specific to state law, but not necessarily. Can someone get a silver platter for the prosecution? Um so he can get to a non-leading question. I mean, somebody needs to remind them. But wait, if you plan a double murder, wouldn't you secure your alibi and not having to bribe her? I don't know how planned. If the prosecution's arguing he got home and this was an act of desperation that day, I don't know how advanced planned that was. Um, so I don't know. But it looks like Alec knew that every time questions came up, he was going to talk about the boat case. So... Going to talk about the bow case. Have they found the clothes from the tree video, the Snapchat video? No, not that we know yet. Not that we know yet. Does the civil boat case go away? The civil boat case can still go on. We know that the Mallory Beach case settled with Maggie's estate, settled with Buster, has not settled with Alec. But what we did hear, um, I will go look for this. What we did hear is that well, from the attorney that I think we'll see testify again in front of the jury, that attorney said that they would go after Alec much less, go after Alec much less if his family was murdered due to vigilantes over the boat case because the jury's not going to return much to them. So it changes the positioning of the um, of the boat case. So Law and Lumber said, extremely common to see a tin ring in jean back pockets of fellas in the South, especially in AG heavy areas. Um, North Carolina State grad here. Um, we did definitely see Alec chewing um, in other videos, so I guess it could also be that. That's not um, unusual, so that's fair. Ugh. I know. There's there's a lot more dip going on in Tennessee than there was in Southern California, and every now and then I'm just like, Ugh. When you say, Ugh. Ugh. hate it, hate it the most, hate it so much. All right, let's go take a look and see. Um, what channel was I going to? I know <laughs> you all told me, and then I forgot. Um, let's see. WLTX, I think. I have no idea where WLTX is located, but they have been streaming the trial. Their audio has been better. Let me go pull up that video and see um where it is. Once I parse through the weather videos, we'll we'll find it real quick. Um, and then we'll fast forward to the end of it. So we should that Snapchat video. That's that's Groundhog Day video. All right, I'm looking. I'm looking. Chat live streaming is always fun, especially when you are looking for something. We'll find it. There's day three. There's uh, nope, nope, nope. Oh, there it is. All right. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna put this also. I'm gonna slow this video down. And I'm going to fast forward to the end. So they are giving cards. Let's see. We are almost at the end here. So let's see. Without the logo, this might be a little bit easier. This is the aggressive uh, interview. It doesn't, you know. Ugh. Let's back up one more time and take a look at the shoes. It is easier to see down here at the at the bottom that those I mean they they are sneakers. They're sneakers. They're just they're sneakers. And what's I wonder whose phone he was sitting on. That's maybe the the 
the officer's phone. And then, yes, you could see at the end as they were closing the door here that those are like a yellow sneaker. Laces on top, sneaker. So, um, yeah, laces on top, sneaker. I don't think he was wearing boat shoes in the Snapchat. In the Snapchat, he's wearing like a what looked like a leather, um, what looked like a leather work like office shoe. So that's what I thought, but we will see. Um, flat on the back pocket. They look like sneakers to me, but you know, they look like sneakers to me. So that's where we're at, but they definitely look like a yellow sneaker. It doesn't mean they're not, they're a laced shoe. Um, so that's what it is. The, but the Snapchat looks like leather shoes. So I don't know what shoes they are, but those look more like a sneaker. Anyway, I don't think the jury is even going to bother going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, but we have. So for all of our curiosity, those look like a sneaker. I don't know. It just is what it is. And you, yeah, they look like a sneaker. They've got reflective on them, but he was wearing shorts when he showed up. So he was wearing shorts when he showed up to um to the house where his to the house where his mother was. And so that's interesting too. All right, let us keep going. We're going to we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. Did they test the top tarp for GSR? We have not had that witness yet. So we don't know what was tested for GSR. We know that the witness who testified did not test it. And we know from opening that the raincoat was tested for GSR. They might not have t ever tested the tarp. Um, could the defense have said that Alec wore it? I don't think they will. I think they'll say, we don't know who, what, where, when. Chad, I would hazard against saying what the jury will, won't do. Um, if they don't find the verdict, you won't be, uh, want them to because the prosecution didn't do their job, not because they failed somehow. I mean, that's a very good point. I think we have not seen a clearly presented case yet, but we're, we've got a long way to go. It feels like we got a long way to go in a short time to get there with this case. If AM goes on the stand and says, I didn't do it. I hired, uh, I hired it done. That's what the evidence obviously says. This is a witch hunt. Would this face a dismissal and double jeopardy. I mean, you can't be twice put in jeopardy for the same crime. And if, and I have not looked if South Carolina has, I don't think they have a murder for hire statute. It would be more of an accomplice theory, but that's not what they charged him with. They charged him with doing this act, but I don't think that he would take the stand at all. We're just going to have to wait. There are a lot of what ifs and unknowns in that hypothetical. Please tell me your travel this week won't cost us law nerd time. It will a little bit, but not a lot. I'm fascinated in this one and don't want to miss a moment. Aaron, I understand. It depends on how late in the day we go on Wednesday when I need to leave for the airport, but I am flying late so that I don't miss much. And then I will be looking like tired, hot garbage on Thursday, but I will be here um, streaming in a different setting, not with my entire setup, but we're still going to do it. We're going to make it work. Question, couldn't the shoe thing be dismissed by saying they didn't wear shoes in the house? Well, no, that's not what the testimony says. So the testimony doesn't show that. Someone in the chat said the video is on Twitter of Alec getting out of the car. We grabbed it, so thank you. Um, what EDB found was that the titles, um, what EOB found was that the titles on the properties are in Maggie's name. I know that Rob from Law & Lumber pulled that up, but um, I think there were additional liens or they were requesting additional liens that Maggie didn't want to put on the properties. That is the bigger question for me about the properties, but we'll see what happens when the witnesses come. Can the jury request a copy of the court transcript? Um, not exactly. They can request read back. Like, can you read us back the testimony of this witness or that witness? Can he appeal due to ineffective counsel? Not at this point. Um, the money stealing the 30 to 40 minute cover story, the bribery for the wedding money. That's what I'd remember as a juror. The juror hasn't the jury hasn't seen the money stealing yet, but they will. What if the state is trying to prove that he would have driven by the bodies because he knew they were at the kennels? That's the direction, Kayla, I think that they're going. I think that whole witness was to say it was the common practice that he would drive out past the kennels 
And so when he drove down the other driveway after calling his wife and her not answering the phone, that it was not his common practice. And the reason he it wasn't his common practice is because he had done it and he knew and he was going to manufacture an alibi. That's what they're going to say. So that's what they're going to say. Um, yep. So totally forgot you were coming to Arizona. Good luck roughing the Super Bowl crowds the way I'm not thrilled. But also when my friends are like, Emily, we're doing this. I was like, yeah, yeah, we are. I, I need some Dave. I need some Dave. I need some, I need some non-summer Dave. I need it. I'm ready for it. Question. Could the dinner cavo turn ugly? Most people discuss problems or gossip. Anything. I mean, anything's possible. We can't really come up with our own theories. What, what the prosecution needs to do is present a cohesive theory of the case. It does not work to the prosecution's benefit to be like, it could be this, it could be this, it could be that, it could be that. That's what the defense does. Because it could be this, this, or that is doubt. The prosecution needs a, a coherent through line. The world was crashing down. He murdered his wife and son. Why? How? Why? How? I don't know. Um, I just don't know. Does this seem like a long break? Yes, it does. Yes, it does seem like a long break. It does. It feels like a long break. Um, so it does. Uh, it does seem like a long break. All right, let's keep going. The blue jacket looks like a beach rain slicker. I mean, somebody else said it looked like a boating slicker. It does. It, it does. It looks like a very big slicker. Um, Dave in the summer is the best. Oh, Dave in the summer is the best, but it's not going to get me through this trial. <laughs> so off season Dave, one of the best Dave shows I ever saw was in February. So I love getting to go see Dave in February. Seriously, meet and greet in Arizona, please. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have time. I am in and out very, very quickly. And if I wasn't doing trial coverage, I would have been able to set one up, but I'm going to be doing trial coverage and trial coverage and then a concert and then I'm back on a plane. So unfortunately, this one is too quick for me. Um, it does look like a trench coat. Question, are they showing the video after the break? What video? I don't know what video you're referring to. Karen, let me know what video. I'm not sure what video we were talking about. Just coming in, did they admit the financials? Yes. Will the jury go to the scene? I don't know if there's any point of them going to the scene. I don't know if there's any point of them going to the scene because we've heard that the scene has changed quite a lot. We've heard that the trees have grown and that it's substantially different than it was at the time of the murder. So I don't know if the scene helps them or helps the prosecution or not. So we will see the video of the witness. Oh no. Shelly's video. I don't think so. no, there's no reason the depot would come in. And if it was going to come in, it would have come in when that witness was testifying. They wouldn't have moved on to another witness. It's very rare that those videos come in. They came in in the Megan the Stallion, Tory Lane's case because the defense implied that the prosecution was um, harassing, threatening, intimidating the witness. So then the prosecution got to bring the whole thing in to show the tenor of the conversation and that they weren't harassing, intimidating the witness. So no, the entire testimony from Shelley won't come in. Uh, is Moselle still owned by the Murdoch's? It's on the market. I don't know if it is sold or not. So, um, Sperry's make trainer sneakers. They are still made by Sperry's. They don't have the same material sneakers. They're plush sneakers. I have, I don't know if it will matter at the end, but we'll see. The shoes are Sperry's. They look a little like boat shoes. I will look. I mean, I don't know how much it matters. The prosecution seemed to say it matter mattered. I don't know how much it'll matter to the end. I think those are details that the bigger details being the blue shirt and the shirt and the different, um, the different, the different definition. So Janice said, every time I see the Elmo and the definition of electric light machine organizer, my mind goes to ELO electric light orchestra. Mine does too. And the, uh, it was Nightbot was telling me too often. I was like, Nightbot, you have to stop. Nightbot has to chill. Cause it was also distracting me. <laughs> so Miss Shelley did initially say Sperry's. She did. That's exactly what she said. And then they were trying to, to chat about it. So, but then the defense got very much into tarp versus raincoat. And then we come to find out there's a tarp and a fucking raincoat. Okay. There's a top tarp and a raincoat. Great. 
I just want to know what's happening with Tom Girardi in court. It looks like Kimberly Archie is there in court. And so I'm going to be looking at that. Um, let's see. The usual media are here. LA Times, Daily Journal, Law.com, Law360, et cetera. I'll be very interested to see what Law360 says. A very frail Tom Girardi enters a federal courthouse for his arraignment in downtown Los Angeles. Gir oh, they've got video. Okay, we're going to talk about Girardi for just a second. I'm sorry for everybody watching the Murdoch case if you're not interested in Girardi as well. However, um, the court is still on break, and I have been covering Girardi for almost for much longer than I've been covering Murdoch because Murdoch unraveled so quickly. But um, there is quite a lot of media at the courthouse waiting. Um, the one Britney hearing I went to, I really thought some of the media were going to like knock Britney's attorney, um, off the stairs. So it's also weird to see courthouses that I used to spend more time in. Cause this is my jurisdiction. Um, so Tom Girardi, I don't need, oh, I guess we've got audio. Like I don't need audio, but we've got Tom Girardi entering court with what looks like a lawyer and potentially a caregiver. Um, and his brother who is his his brother who is his um conservator i think is who's in front of him so but they are having him walk into court i'm sure they could have arranged for him to come into court other ways i don't know why they didn't they could have arranged for him to drive underneath the courthouse they could have arranged for him to come to court if walking was challenging they could have made accommodations for that but they didn't which is an interesting, interesting thing, but he is going to be arraigned in court. Whether they will ask for him to go into custody will be interesting to me. So I will be keeping an eye on that hearing with regard to Tom Girardi while this case is going on. The court is back and talking to the attorneys. I had the volume on. Sorry, y'all. And I didn't hear anything it. before the jury comes. Oh, there is something before the jury comes. All right, I'm going to speed this up so we can catch up to real time. Something's going on with the attorneys, and we'll see. All right, I'll be very inter I'll be keeping an eye on both things, just so you know, chat. Yes, sir. He said that they were complicating matters. That's not good. This all looks very strange sped up. The audio has broken. All right, Mr. Waters. Well, Your Honor, I, and I don't know if Your Honor has a, another instruction that you prefer. Uh, I, you know, oh, okay. We would do the language just a little different in that particular one. But Limiting I think instruction. Fundamentally, the principles are accurate. Uh, I do think that the next to last sentence is superfluous because that's already said, but I think that's fine. Uh, and in, in the end, I don't think that uh, there's, there's too much that we have an issue with that particular charge. And Your Honor, one matter, other matter before we bring the jury in. Who do you want me you want to hear from me now? Um, the state intends on introducing through not this witness. If this witness is another witness, the, there's a GSR person, specific GSR person. That's correct. It'll be the witness after this. Okay. Um, so GSR today. GSR gunshot residue on that blue jacket. Um, we would uh, object to any such testimony under a 403 analysis. Prejudice outweighs the probative, and I'm struggling to find out, uh, to figure out what the probative is. So I, I'm uh, in this, uh, I mean, I think it's. I don't think you're actually, actually, actually struggling. I think give you some sense of what it proves. A jacket, I might point out, no one has put in the hands of the defendant. I don't think that's true. And the tarp that they found, they never tested for GSR, blood, DNA. Well, that's a failure um, on their part. And everyone says tarp, that's a jacket. Um, and uh, I don't know how you connect it to the defendant. If the, if the prejudice far outweighs any probative value in that it's not been connected to him, even circumstantially not connected to him, the only witness to it, uh, Shelley, uh, Smith. who I talked to a couple times, indicated that was not what he had in his hands. Um, and
and uh, she'd never seen it before, never seen it with him. So, Your Honor, we'd oppose it under a 403 analysis. Uh, yes, Your Honor. I think if you listen to the testimony of uh, Ms. Smith in totality, uh, first of all, she identified a picture uh, where she said, yeah, that looks like what it was. It she was did. balled up. And that picture, of course, was then identified by Ms. Moore as where they recovered the actual raincoat, which, of course, she was is a very, very large raincoat and very easily could be identified uh, as a tarp. I think uh, any issues that Mr. Harpoolian wants to make, uh, he can certainly argue those to the jury, uh, but the connection has Agreed. been established between Ms. Smith and that particular raincoat and looking at the picture and saying, that's yeah, that looks like what I saw. Uh, additionally, with it's that tarp other tarp, -like raincoat. she also testified that there was no silver on that tarp. And if you look at the picture of that other tarp, uh, it, it is uh, half uh, blue and half silver. So it's a very. There was, I think, uh, Miss. And I'll have to find the uh, exhibit. Stand by for me real quick, Your Honor. All right, I'm going to switch feeds so we get back Today, to yes, our. Um, we get back to closed captioning. Unless this feed stays this fuzzy, because this feed looks awful at the moment. So, Your Honor, and I can put them up for Elmo or hand them up, whichever you prefer. But we have uh, States Exhibit 224. Oh, they are fighting to keep that jacket out. You can see with a it's lot a of silver fight. on it. But it's a good fight. But States Exhibit 411, uh, Ms. Smith identified as that's what it looked like. You can see that balled up thing right there. And that is ultimately the rain jacket, which is you saw uh, particularly on redirect uh, with Ms. Gowd, um, you know, this is extremely large, very easily could look like a tarp. And when she balled it up, Ms. Smith said, yeah, that's what it looked like. So I think there's been enough of a nexus established as to the probative value. And what you'll of course hear is, is that uh, from the GSR experts, Keep telling very us high levels of GSR uh, were found within the inside, the inside of that uh, blue rain jacket, which again is this big and, and very, very long. Uh, again, Mr. Harpootley can argue to the jury whatever inferences he wants to, but I think the state has established enough of a nexus to not only make it relevant, but to make its probative value not substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice. Yes, sir. It's a fight they have to fight. Or is misquoting what Ms. Smith said. She said, when she was shown that photo, she said it's the same color or like the same color. She never, ever, ever said that's what I saw him with as he came through the door. She said put, that's what it looked like. And by the way, she like. found the tarp. That couldn't be the tarp. This is because, lawyers splitting hairs, um, and it matters. The tarp was found uh, downstairs across a chair, um, which is what she said he walked in with. So the tarp in the box obviously isn't it. And, I mean, she said the tarp that he came in with was the one that was on the chair when he came down, not the coat. All she ever said was that blue coat it balled up appears to be the same color no one has ever said that she saw him or that's not exactly what she said either with that jacket and i would also point out um that <clears throat> what that i hate what? to say this but i would say suspect it. there are a number of rain jackets in, mo in th th this area of the state that have gsr on them in them around them so there's no no one that says that's a fair argument why do you hate to say it all she ever said was it and, and by the way it's all balled up all she said was it looks like the same color she saw a picture of the rain jacket and said that is not what he was carrying when he came in all right she did say that the item is in evidence the witness testified as to the location of um yeah, once the item's in, there's not much that can be done. The item of evidence on where she believed that it was placed by the defendant, uh, it's in evidence. Obviously, the state contends that it has some um, inculpatory uh, evidence on it. Um, this is a circumstantial case, and circumstantially, Proof can may be offered on that on the issue of whether or not um, this uh, gunshot residue or whatever it might be can be traced to the defendant. And I overrule the objection. And I find it's um, the evidence offered is more 
probative than prejudicial, though I do not believe a probative versus prejudicial analysis is required on this issue. But to the extent that it is, I find that it's more He's going. probative than prejudicial, and I deny the motion to prevent the state from offering testimony. Okay. Accept your ruling. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, you don't have much so of a choice. Bring the jury. Yeah. Bring Bring the jury. All right. Well, Jim has gotten smart with the cameras and is now covering up his conversations with his client like he's a coach in the NFL. He's now covering covering it up so we can't look at what he's saying, which is fair. I don't know who this next witness is going to be. We don't have volume in, in the courtroom. We'll get that in a minute. But they're bringing, it sounds like they're bringing in the gunshot residue witness. They need to make this very clear where the gun, gunshot residue is fine or found and why it matters. It seems to be the state's theory that Alec used the raincoat to bring guns into his mom's house or to bring guns out on the property because there was a lot of driving around in trucks and ATVs and somebody went over train tracks or whatever. And so it seems like there was a lot of conversation about a lot of activity happening and then that bundled up thing being put into the bottom of the closet or going upstairs. And they're arguing that what the witness Shelly Smith testified to is a tarp, not the raincoat with the GSR. The prosecution's like, look, they can argue to the jury that everybody's raincoat in South Carolina has GSR all up in the inside of it. But that also doesn't look like a raincoat that zips down the front and zips up. So it's not like if you're shooting in it, it would be open in the front. Thank you. It looks Your like next witness. More of a, in that sense, next witness. pull over. <laughs> state. State, get your shit together. The judge doesn't want to ask you twice. Ooh, look at it. Judge Newman looks pissed. Call your witness, state. Did you see that look? He looked annoyed. He was like, state's next witness, and the prosecutor's still walking around. And then he's like, state's next Raise your right hand witness. Do you affirm the testimony about the guilt of court in this trial shall be the truth? So I think this is the I CSI who did the GSR. State your name again for the record. Very last name. My name is Natasha Moody, last name M-O-O-D-I-E. I imagine she's a criminalist based on what they just talked about. I spelled it with a Y on my paper, I'm sorry. It's okay. Ms. Moody, where are you from? Uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And for whom do you work? Bank of America, N.A. What do you do for oh. Bank of America, N.A.? I am a consumer resolution associate. That's consumer not where I thought this was going associate. at all. What does a consumer resolution associate do? I uh, manage a portfolio of litigated matters. I appear on behalf of the bank um, for trials, depositions, mediations, and I also uh, review our business records on a daily basis. Your business records, were so you asked to review business records. records for Bank of America NA in relation to this case? I was, I did. I like her glasses too. I am showing you three items labeled for identification as states exhibit 415, Very 416, and 417. Do you recognize these items? I do. Checks. And how do you recognize them? Um, I reviewed them and I also initialed them. Discs. And generally speaking, what are these items? Uh, these are uh, documents uh, for this case, um, opening account documents, um, fake forge. monthly statements for various accounts, and copies of checks for this account, fake for forge. various accounts. Fake Forge! So are they bank records? Yes. If this is Fake Forge, this is very out of order. Yeah, if this is Fake Forge stuff, this is very out of order. Um, but we'll see. So. I think somebody offered her some water and she's like, I have some. It seems like she testifies quite a lot because she is the Bank of America custodian of records. Um, so it might have been it might have been a timing issue. This might be a witness out of order. Um, 
and it might just be because it really might be because of her schedule it sounds like as many custodian of records they end up testifying quite a lot and being all over the place i could i could never the flying all over and having to like go into a courtroom and deal with different attorneys all day long oh my god oh my god i could literally never i could literally never and then to have to look cute on top of it nope nope but i can't wait to hear what she has to say oh my god counsel stop explaining is dick cross examining this witness on financial records Oh. Your Honor, state moves to introduce uh, exhibits 415, 416, and 417 into evidence at this time, my understanding, with uh, subject to uh, any objections from Your Honor's previous ruling off um, today. Yes, sir. Ms. Harpoon. Your Honor, may I confer with uh, Mr. Yes. I sure hope that you have some summary records for this witness, because... We're all just sitting here. The admission of these records, I would ask you to uh, give whatever cautionary charge you're going to do. Okay. All right. Be happy to. Limiting instruction. Um. I like this witness's hair too. It's great. It's only fair if we're commenting on all the gentlemen's Ladies and gentlemen, um, evidence or testimony is about to be offered. Um, this might be a strategic error for the defense. defendant may have been involved in other criminal activity. I think that might be a strategic uh, error. And that evidence is not evidence or proof that he committed the offenses charged in the indictments. This testimony has been allowed and is being allowed for the limited purpose of assisting the state in proving motive. You may not consider this evidence for purposes of character of Mr. Murdoch, nor may you consider this evidence as evidence of his propensity to commit other crimes or that it is more likely that he committed the crimes with which he is currently on trial. It is being allowed based on the state's representation that it helps explain the defendant's motive to commit the crimes for which he is accused. And you may proceed. Very briefly, Ms. Moody. I think that highlights it we more. We have three discs that are uh, now in evidence. Uh, what uh, what information is on that first like, disc? Ooh, you tea. indicated that was bank records. Um, do you have any additional uh, information to describe those bank records? Um, I do, but I don't have the disc in front of me. Oh. <laughs> She's like, I'd sure love to tell you that if you would give me back. Show you state's exhibit labeled four one five. What uh, records are on that disc? Um, they are checking account ending, it, it involves checking accounts, and I can give you the uh, last four digits of those. If you would, please. Um, checking account ending in the last four digits is 6779. Um, it has account opening documents um, for that one. The next one is account ending in 7991, and those are account opening documents for that um, account and then checking account ending in 7625 and that's account opening documents for that account and then also monthly statements and um, supporting documents for the all three accounts thank you now showing you states exhibit 416 what's on this desk uh, these are credit card ending in uh, sorry 9559 <laughs> And um, those are uh, monthly statements in that and um, account looking opening through people's financial statements is documents. fascinating. States Exhibit 417, what's on that disk? Also another credit card ending in 8591. Um, and these are application accompanying documents and monthly statements for this account. So. He does not look thrilled with this testimony. I am very interested to see if they are going to do a summary 
document of the witnesses or the summary document of this information? Uh, these are in evidence, but we would not have any objection to them except as to our previously made objections. Yeah, sit down, Dick. We yes. got it. Why is the prosecutor? Why is everybody conferring back there? Can we just ask no questions? questions for this witness, Your Honor? No, no questions. Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Moody. Moody. Moody, you may step down and you're excused. Thank you. Okay, so just the foundation is. Did somebody else review them then? Let me call your next witness. This poor witness is like yes. really. Now call Jamie Hall. So just the foundation that will be testified to later. No, just the foundation. Just the foundation of the bank records. So another witness will likely testify to those records. We'll see who it is. But she is probably back to the airport. I do. State your name again for the records. By your last name, please. All right. Is this the GSR CSI? Yep, because there's a briefcase. My name is Jamie Hall, H-A-L-L. -L. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Who's your mom and now? I'm currently employed at the West Columbia Police Department as an evidence custodian. How long have you been there? Um, since April of 2022. Will you please tell the ladies and gentlemen What'd you do this before that? about Jamie Hall? It's much to your background, as personal background as you want to. I'll leave that to you, but oh. specifically, um, your education and background that led you to law enforcement, please. Yes, sir. I grew up in the Midlands area of South Carolina. Uh, upon graduating high school, I attended Clemson University and obtained my bachelor's of science degree in wildlife and fisheries biology. After that, I spent a couple years um, traveling and working some various jobs. I moved back to the area in um, wildlife and fisheries 2013 and began looking to start a career and ended up at SLED in 2015 as an administrative assistant in the trace evidence department in the forensic services laboratory. Uh, I was an administrative assistant until 2017 when I began, became an evidence technician, or, excuse me, a forensic technician too um, in the trace evidence lab. When did you graduate Clemson? Uh, sorry, in 2010. Okay. Um, Go sports so in team, college. After you traveled some, things. Um, you, you started working in SLED in what year? In 2015. Okay. What was your job then? I was an administrative assistant. And what, what does that mean? Um, for the trace evidence department, that involved answering phone calls, filing documents, um, pretty much normal administrative duties. In, in did you further your education or your experiences while you were at SLED in that field? Uh, no, sir. Um, when I became the um, technician in 2017, that's when I began, began the in-house training um, for that career. Okay. Tell us about the in-house training when um, you became the, the forensic technician. Yeah. So that training involved oral and practical examinations in-house in, under the supervision of an analyst. So in which I learned um, how to properly handle the evidence and process the evidence for potential GSR. Um, I also um, oversaw some testimonies of some analysts to be familiar with courtroom policies as well. And I took some outside training from Hook College in Chicago as well. Hook College Hook. in Chicago? Hook, yes, sir. What, like what was Captain that training? Hook? Um, it, was, it was training um, regarding the scanning electron microscope, which is used for GSR analysis. That's the an acronym is SEM for that? The SEM, yes, sir. Okay. And when did you leave SLED? Uh, in March of 2022. Okay. And do you mind, you're working where now? At uh, the West Columbia Police Department. West Columbia Police Department. And you are there what? Evidence custodian. Okay. So she did the now, GSR for um, SLED. Back in June of 2021, you were a forensic <laughs> technician for SLED. Yes, sir. In, in, Special agent, forensic technician? No, sir, I was not considered an agent or considered law enforcement. I was just the forensic technician, too. Okay. So then, in June of 2021, She's what was your job technician. on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, my primary role in the trace evidence department as a forensic technician was to prepare evidence for GSR analysis. Oh, girl, we know. That include GSR kits as well as inanimate objects that came in for potential GSR testing. Yeah, all day with those And we're going to have Ms. Flesher 
Fletcher testify right after you, but what is a GSR kit? Um, a GSR kit is um, an envelope that goes out to um, officers or investigators so that they can collect on scene um, from a potential suspect's hands. Um, and it involves, um, it has all the items they need, gloves so that they can make sure they're not contaminating the subject's hand. Um, and then the little vials that contain the GSR particle lifts with a double-sided adhesive that's used to dab across their hands to pick up any potential GSR. So those are kind of done in the field, if you will? Yes, sir. <clears throat> After okay. a local law, law enforcement agency uses one of these kits, what happens to it? Um, when they decide that they need it analyzed, they submit it to the laboratory. Mm. And then when it comes into the laboratory, I prepare it for analysis. We're back to So uh, that involves me making sure foundation. it's been properly sealed and initialed, handled properly, the correct kit. There are some, a variety of kits out there. Um, our lab has particular kits that we accept, so I make, confirm that it is an acceptable kit. And I also confirm that um, it was collected within the allowed time frame. On a, a living person, we're touching things all the time um, and possibly contaminating or removing the GSR. So we do have a six hour time limit on kits collected from individuals. We've so if a kit Jay comes Meadows, in we've already to had or your possession, one or two GSR witnesses. So they're assuming the jury remembers. Collected during that six point. hour time period? Yes, sir, I do. And how do you do that? Uh, we have what we call an information worksheet include, included in each GSR kit that the officer fills out that includes the time or the estimated time that the shooting occurred, as well as the time that the kit was collected. Council, can we keep going? We are doing so well. We were doing so well. It's March State 13. Can they explained you were GSR with, with previous witnesses. They should do it again. Can, uh, how? Can you tell? Um, yes, sir. This uh, has the unique sled lab number and item number. Um, and it also has my initials on the day that I processed it. 6821JEH. Yes, sir. What's the E stand for? Elizabeth. Okay. Court, would you open this, please? What's the E stand for? What's your favorite date? April 23rd. Not too hot, not too cold. Just requires a light jacket. Sorry, y'all. We're back to foundational things and unboxings. It's just... I do like the, like, cardigan jacket situation she has going on. The maroon jacket. I dig it. Would you like me to open the inner package? Uh, yes, sir. Again, it also has my date and initials um, from the day that I processed it. I could do an unboxing. You know what initials I would be unboxing? Again, yes, sir. 6821. You yes, know what sir. I would be unboxing? And when you're processing this, tell us again, what are you looking to see? Whether it's what's done I have or not, or just chips. tell us what you Okay. Have. Um, so for a GSR kit, um, I start by what using what we call an inventory worksheet. And on that worksheet, what I'm doing is um, confirming the um, manufacturer of the kit as well as the lot number for the kit. They have lot numbers for quality control purposes to make sure they're not contaminated Holly, um, before they're so. used for collection. I'm confirming who the kit was collected from, that six hour time frame. Um, and during that time, I also label the individual particle lifts inside with the unique lab number, item number, date and initials um, for control purposes. And I believe a, a sheet has been in. I know we a, were so intrigued, um, and now we're here. Collected this GSR kit from the defendant. Are you aware of that? Um, are you referring to the gunshot residue analysis information sheet? That's exactly what I'm referring to. <laughs> yes, sir. That's what I would have um, used to confirm the six-hour time frame. Okay. And it's in evidence already. I'm not sure exactly what number, but do you have that copy? Yes, sir. I do. Okay. Counsel, it's your job to know what number. Already, if you'll trust me, this has already been um, entered into evidence. Um, did you use this in examining and determining whether this was collected properly? Evidence. Yes, sir, I did. It okay. also has my date and initials on it. So using the form, show these ladies and gentlemen what you did. What? H how you came uh, up and... Uh, uh, what? So, yeah, uh, what? there's um, a section here at the bottom. So we have the su su subject's name from whom it was collected. And who is that? Um, this one says Richard Alexander Murdoch. Okay. 
um, as well as the time and date the shooting occurred, 6, 7, 21, 10 p.m. And that's information that's gathered at the scene so from somebody, So they put right? it yes, at sir, 10 p.m. This particular kit says that it was filled out by collecting officer Brian Vandor. Sorry if I messed that that's up. That's good enough. Okay. <laughs> he already testified. Um, and then at the bottom, the collecting officer um, has also signed and dated um, that it was collected at six, on 6, 7, 21 at 11, 15 p.m. And would that 11.15 fit in the time period where you're saying, okay, well, I can pass this on to be analyzed? Yes, sir. It's an hour and 15 minutes. And so not taking away from what's your job at all, but one of your jobs is to make sure that's done correctly? That's yes, sir. Way. No, I, I think the instruction the, uh, was untimely. If you will, to make yes, sir. Sure. I make sure that there's nothing out of the ordinary with them. Um, occasionally you might would have a little crack in the vial, but I've never had anything damaged. I love that she just said might would. So in it your is, opinion, these will collect them properly and phrase. you pass them on for, a, for an hour? To the best of my knowledge, yes, sir. All dress chips are Canadian ruffles. Lay's also has them. I get them on Amazon. Sometimes law nerds send them to me. Now, we're they're there. all the flavors together. And they're freaking divine and I love them. Let me ask you this much. They're so Local good. Local agencies that you uh, examine items for potential they're evidence, just so in good. this case, gunshot resident, how do they get to your so. the lab? Um, typically, the officers from the local agency um, submit them through our evidence control department. And once they're submitted that way, um, that's when they're assigned their unique lab number and item numbers for each piece of evidence. Um, and then based on the type of analysis that that agency requested, um, we would get notice that it needs to be processed. And so I would pick it up from evidence control and bring it upstairs to the trace lab to begin the processing. And it, it, it's all that documented from local agency to y'all and where it goes from there? Um, I can't attest to what the outside agencies do. I believe it probably varies agency to agency. But once it's been logged into our system downstairs, it is tracked throughout the, the laboratory for every hand that touches it. That's kind of what we refer to as a chain, correct? Yes, sir. It's chain referred to as the chain of custody. Chain of custody. Let her finish. Oh, now, my God. Did you have some other items uh, of potential evidence in this over case her that you examined? Yes, sir. I had several other items. I'm just rooting for the court um, reporter to yell at him to stop jumping over the end of her answers and just calm down. I'm sorry, Chad, if I'm making you hungry. I love them so much. I had them for lunch. It needed to be discussed. Oh, he just keeps on jumping over the ends of answers. So I'm going to answer some questions while they're figuring out what they're doing. Um, Dave, with the cutest dancing feet on the planet. Yes. Smart. With regard to Tom Girardi, I address this in Wednesday's The Emily Show podcast, and we talk about it. Ask me if you I can recorded that yesterday. Identify this. It's all, and does it relate to your testimony? What's in the box? I no longer see my initials, but um, I did process items that were in container D, and this is marked with container D for this case number, yes, sir. And do you, would you open it up then to see if yes. you can further find your mark with the court's permission? Yes, we need to know where her, okay. she needs to go looking for her initials. Just giving appreciation for Judge Clifton, Sancy Pants, Newman's. Yeah, he definitely had the sass for the prosecution today. Also, this trial is now running long, and so the judge has to be aware of that. Wait, Rob, you haven't had all dressed chips? Rob. More unboxings by sled. Emily. Would it save you money to send her? Yeah, but then Runkle would have to remember to actually go and send me chips, which is asking a lot. He's very busy. Rob, they can't. Once it's down, it's down. <laughs> On the podcast. Sorry, the podcast is only live while it's live, Rob. Yeah, I don't know what they're doing with the props. Oh yeah, this trial is going to get long, much longer than they thought. They're very good. March 21, excuse me, it's your lab number. 21 contained in states 418 at this point for identification. Do you recognize that? 
Uh, yes, I recognize it as the lab item number 20. And what is lab item number 20? It was a brown paper bag containing one was... pair of green cargo shorts. Ah, the shorts he was wearing. And also contained in 418. When police arrived. Lab number 21. Can you tell me if you recognize that? Yes, sir. It's lab number or item number for this case uh, 19, which was a brown paper bag containing one white T-shirt. Okay. Now, okay. are we keep? What are we doing? What is happening? Are we laying foundation? Did she test it? Did she not test it? I don't know. The chat's asking, did they ever grab the tree clothing? I don't know if they ever found it, grabbed it, if they knew that video existed till much not later. Not without objection. Not clear. Without objection. Admit it. Bring the evidence. Time I imagine the defense will have her unbox those. If she is going to be the person who tested the GSR, they're going to need to qualify her as an expert. I don't think they've done that yet. Um, Thank you, I'm sorry. So there's lots, I got lots of questions. Please, ask you, please may I have this quick question? Please answer. Look them. at 423, 424, and 425. My patience on Do you today. recognize these and do they relate to what you're talking about right now? Then. Yes, sir. These are um, PGSR collection worksheets um, from clothing that I generate during my process of collecting from inanimate objects. Okay. Inanimate objects. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, let's start with what an inanimate object is. The shirt. 423. Yes, sir. Uh, tell these folks what you did with the shirt. Um, so anytime we're processing clothing or an inanimate object in the lab, we start by making sure everything's been thoroughly cleaned. And we also place down parchment paper to just as an extra ba um, check and balance to make sure there's nothing um, contaminating the evidence. We also place what we call a clothing blank out onto the table where we are processing. That's just another one of those double-sided adhesive stubs. And it's left open and exposed to the environment to make sure there's no contamination in the environment. That's how I start all of my clothing. Then I confirm that everything is um, adequately sealed and documented. And I open my items and lay them out on the parchment paper. Um, I photograph items and then I do label those items for identification later if needed. And then I will sample the clothing item uh, closest in the areas that would be closest to the discharge of the firearm. So in this case, we're talking about a t-shirt. So I will sample the right chest and sleeve area together and the left chest and left sleeve together. So if you want to draw a line down your midline for right and left, and then we typically go down to just below the chest area. And is that what you do with every shirt? Yes, sir. If it's a long sleeve garment, I would typically use a separate, um, a separate particle lift for the chest area and the arms just because the adhesive doesn't last quite as long. And if you said this, I apologize, I'm tired. Why are you doing those areas? It's closest to the discharge of a firearm. Potential discharge, so that's where you test. Yes, sir. Well, looking at the shirt, look 418, the shirt that's contained in here. <sighs> Which one's the shirt? Um, 19. 19? Yes, sir. Before you get to doing the particle <clears throat> list, what's the first thing you do? I confirm um, what the item is and that it's properly sealed and initialed. Do you open it? After I clean it, I open it. Yes, sir. And do you make observations of items when you first open it? Uh, yes, sir. Anything that seems out of the ordinary for any item is documented on the worksheet in the comments section. Okay. And Did you do that here? Comment section. That's where you put your thoughts, right? Yes, sir. Anything that may, um, again, be out of the ordinary or affect the analysis later. Are they going to move the camera? Thank you. Thank you so much. And just to go back, you go down a bit. Yep. So Appreciate it. Right sleeve, right chest, left sleeve, left chest. 
Uh, Haynes BP Sheriff, right? We had interesting things happen. Introducing 423 in the evidence. I don't think it's in evidence yet. But no <laughs> objection. I object to it being called a PPT. Those three exhibits going I, I thought I'd say that. If I didn't, I apologize. Right. Okay. <laughs> Is this a Haynes BP t shirt? Yes, sir, it was. Okay. And item 19 one. What are your Excuse comments me. underneath there? What makes uh, it small be reddish brown stains observed? Shirt had an odor of laundry detergent. What do you mean by that? An odor of laundry detergent? It, it oh. just um, smelled freshly laundered, which is not typical uh, of the lab. Typically, clothing smells slightly musky when we get Stinky. it. Stinky. And you it's examined this funk. shirt when? On June 8th of 2021. Now, you didn't know. Did you have any knowledge about this case whatsoever? I just knew that we had asked to make it a priority in the lab. Clothes normally smell you, you attempted musky. to collect particle lists from that shirt. This is the I white did collect particle lists from the shirt. Yes, sir. Next, uh, states four. 25. Sorry, we're out of order here. This is also your clothes, uh, clothing work sheet. Um, can I see the top of that sheet? I'm sorry. When sorry. did anyone have time to wash uh, yes, a shirt sir? or throw a shirt through the dryer? And what was this uh, that you examined? Who's washing the shirt? When this is was the worksheet we generated uh, when we collected from a seat belt that was collected from a 2021 Chevy Suburban South Carolina tag CZL420. Interesting. I think we have it marked for ID only. It's marked until the person who examines it submits it into evidence. That's what the court this? said like four days ago. Strike that. I'm sorry. The seatbelt states 100. What, what is happening? Are they looking for the seatbelt? Stage 100. All right, y'all. Can you look right at this back. and see if you haven't examined that before? Does it relate to your testimony? Uh, yes, sir. This was sled item number 142, and it also has my date and initials on it as well. All right, what did you do with stakes 100? Uh, at the direction of the analyst, Megan Fletcher, I collected samples from various areas on the seatbelt. Can, can, can you tell the ladies and gentlemen, Jerry, how did you determine where you were going to collect samples? Um, since this was not our typical item, I collected from areas in which Megan instructed me to collect. Which was where? Um, we collected from the buckle, three different areas of the belt, and the latch plate. Can you show the jury where you collected? Yeah. So um, this... I believe it was what we call the latch plate. Okay. Sorry if I'm misspeaking on that, but, and then um, the buckle was, oh gosh, this area here, and we did the top and bottom of it. And the three sections were just, um, we measured the length for each section, did a section, rolled more out, and did the next section. And how were you actually doing it with the particle lifts? How were you collecting uh, so, them? So, uh, as stated before, the particle lifts have a double-sided adhesive on it, and you just repeatedly dab that across the garment or the item that you're collecting until it loses its adhesive abilities. 100, we'd offer your honor. No objection, your honor. Is it? Thank you. And looking back on the um, sheet this noted here, that's where you went through and did your inventory sheet, correct? Yes, sir. And this is to document you did what you did, right? Yes, sir. Now, did you also have an occasion to uh, examine the pants in this case? It's already, I believe, in evidence. I did um, a collect from some cargo shorts. And those were also included on what I just took down off the Elmo, but can you tell the folks where you collected 
or tried to collect lifts off the of cargo shorts and why you collect it in those areas? Um, yes, sir. For any type of pants or shorts, we always collect from the right growing and the left growing area. Again, that's the area that's closest to the discharge of a firearm. And that's standard. That's what you do. That is standard practice. Now, did you... I hope I didn't miss anything, y'all. Is that correct, Mr. Griffin? Yes, Your Honor. Is that noted? <sighs> Would you mind opening it up for it? First of all, do you, do you know whether or not to examine a pair of shoes in this case? I Can did, you? and these are the shoes sled item number 21. Okay. Would you please open that for the Oh, whose gentlemen? shoes are they? Who knew we were going to get a close-up of shoes? Hopefully it's the shoes we've been talking about all day. Because those are unopened. Paul's shoes have already been opened. They wouldn't be testing Paul's shoes. So hopefully these are Alex's shoes. And we just see what shoes the police recovered. It's so much easier for you to shown them to the witness earlier. At least they've got scissors up there. They tested the seatbelt and shorts for GSR. Great. Let's see the shoes. Put, put on gloves. Somebody put on gloves for fuck's sake. Yeah, it's Somebody put on gloves. Yes, ma'am. appreciate this witness for putting on gloves. To be fair, I don't think these attorneys know how loud it is. Before you cut in that, do you see J.E.H. on here? Uh, yes, sir, I do. On 6821, I signed my initials. This is all the foundation for these items. So what is all that right there? Uh, I believe it's yard debris. Okay. Court permission to dump this right here, or can I get a trash can? What? Can you let the defense see it before you decide to dump anything? You can't just dump things, counsel. Maybe have her take the shoes. Good God. Maybe just have her take the shoes out of the paper and put the paper back in the box. What are we dumping? Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. These are states 419 in without oh my objection. God. Can you show these to the jury? Yes, sir. Those are the shoes that were in the video. Are they, are they Nikes? Show the jury what you, I, I'll hold them. Show no. the jury what you- No, gloves! Are. God in um, heaven! So with shoes, when we collect from them, we're gonna collect again to the area that would be closest to the discharge of the firearm. So the front of the shoe. Um, so in this case, I would do the area where the laces would typically be and the front toe, um, depending on how well the adhesive continues it will depend on how far back i go but i start with the toe and then work my area down the sides those are the shoes Is from the video the condition they were when you saw them Gina, counsel you should put on gloves there was more grassy type material on them when i had them you know this shit you just and dumped out just in, the dump in the trash can with the court's permission and in, in, in here did you indicate on your comment section Yes. Whether or not yard debris was present? Yes, sir. I commented that shoes were wet with yard debris present. Wet with yard debris? Yes, sir. Did you, on June 8th, oh now, go back in your mind, mm -hmm. I'm, when you saw these, in addition to wet and yard debris, did you make any other notes in the comment section about those shoes? I did not. Do you remember, did you see anything that looked like blood? I did not make any note of that, no, sir. With your naked eye? No, sir. Top or bottom? No, sir. Okay. If you had, would you have noted it? That's the follow-up question. If you had seen blood, would you have noted it? Is the follow-up question he's looking for. What is hap- What is happening? He 
he's just like holding them up. He's like, look at the shoesies. Look at the shoesies. Uh, with no, those look like Nikes, by the way, with no gloves. Did you have any other items that you examined that, that were presented to you for examination either by yourself or with Megan Fletcher? Yes, sir. What was that? It was sled item number 173. And it was, uh, we described it as one blue rain jacket slash poncho. Okay. And, and was this the same? No. When did you examine the poncho? Uh, I believe we began on October 5th, 2021. Okay. So is it fair to say that the clothes, the shirt, the pants, and the shoes were on uh, uh, June 8th of 2021? Let me check my notes. This is... Uh, uh, yes, sir, that's correct. June 8th of 2021. And I didn't ask you, let's not apologize. When, you, when did you examine Council, the... Council, uh, go uh, back the to speaker? your home. Stop. Why are, your back is to the jury. You're standing next to the witness, looking at her notes over her shoulder. Go the back to the was podium. examined on September 1st, 2021. Oh! And, and uh, again, the specific date for the raincoat was what? Uh, October 5th, 2021. And tell the ladies and gentlemen, this take is us so off putting. Now. Um, how did you examine that garment, the rain jacket? Uh, this was also not our typical garment, and I believe there was some information provided um, from investigations. So everything I did in this case was at the direct, or in this for this particular item was at the direct, ed, um, the direct supervision of Megan Fletcher. She essentially told me where she would like me to collect, and she documented everything on the note sheet while I physically collected the particle list. Great. This is making me so, I'm so uncomfortable. Uh, the, the, can I just, is this just yard debris? Let me just yeet it into the trash can. You, she could have taken the shoes out of the paper, showed the shoesies with her gloves on, put the shoesies back in the paper, put the paper down into the box. Council? How much time have you spent at Moselle? I've got questions. I've got questions. Cause I'm just, what? Am I being picky? Am I being too picky? Chat, am I being too correct? picky? Cause I'm flabbergasted. The particle list from the rain jacket and I believe there's no ejection except the further the ejection they made previously. No additional ejection, 421. I also wish she would have been like, please so let me don't. Let go back in time real quick. Are these the uh, particle lifts you took from the seatbelt? 427. Yes, sir. My initials are also on each individual stub. And that's sort of like the officer has in the scene. You're now doing it in the lab. Taking particle lifts, correct? Correct. Okay. You know, we saw the other witness say the particle you want from gloves 420 for that. lifts from 19, 20, and 21. The witnesses have to speak pants. up. The shirt and the shoes were these the particle lifts in 420 that you actually took? Yes, sir. Again, the two. Yes, sir. And your initials is on. Yes, sir. Uh, now, 421, you said it was a little different, unusual. How, how did you take the particle lifts on this rain? Can you go stand I believe everything was in, considered in Megan's custody while I was doing the collection. And then it was transferred directly to my custody when I um, carbon coated the particle lifts. That's just a process where a thin layer of carbon is added. It allows the analyst to get better better images on the instrument. It doesn't do anything to add or remove GFSR. Um, it, it just simply adds a layer, a very thin layer of carbon. Um, so it was in my custody at that time, but prior to that, it was in Megan's custody. Okay. And while the court allowed whatever just happened to happen and the defense was like, whatever, the perception to the jury that the prosecutor's like, we just don't need this, even if it doesn't matter, the perception to the jury is fucking bad. There are other ways to deal with it. And the way that this is happening is, is 
I'm flabbergasted. The poor court reporter is like, what? Minus Why is my desk now your evidence storage? Is this the rain jacket? What? Just... Grab me. Is this the jacket? Yeah, put on gloves. The female attorney put on gloves. Can somebody look at him and yes, just sir. Uh, my dates, the date and my initials are here in the bottom cuff. So you looked at this rain jacket. Can yes, y'all can y'all throw so some Blackman spirit fingers you. at yes, your sir. guy? And tell the ladies and gentlemen Counsel! how did you process? Where did you attempt to get particle in? Um basically the entire garment. Um we marked it off in different sections again at where Megan advised me to collect from and I repeatedly dabbed the particle lift across each section um, until it lost adhesive. These particle lifts? Yes, sir. You dabbed each one of these? Yes, sir. Okay. And what are these little things on here? These um, tape or the? I'm not sure what those are. Okay. Now you did the outside of this garment? Correct. Did you do anything else to it? We also sampled the inside of this garment as well. So you actually turned it inside ah! out and took samples from the inside? That's correct. Okay. Megan Fletcher was with you? Yes, sir. Right. What about the hood? Did you test it or, tip, or take samples from the outside of the hood? Yes, sir, we did. Did you take samples from the inside of the hood? Yes, sir, we did. Oh my God, stop touching, stop. What? The thing is with the guns, it's a little bit different. The guns don't have powder on them and residue on them. You hear him going like this with his hands. It's because it's covered in chemicals. I, I've i lost my mind. I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what's happening. I have never seen literally anything like this. And while I was entertained that he was the My Cousin Vinny lawyer last week, this week I am regretting that analogy and I am, I am now just a bit horrified and not entertained anymore. I'm just, what is happening? I'm so uncomfortable. Karen, thank you. About the prosecutors back to the jury, having served on four juries, I can tell you that the first rule should be do not annoy or disrespect the jury. Yes, yes, I've done, I've done lots of jury trials. You do not turn your back to the jury. The jury, it, I don't know, it's like a cheerleading competition. You keep, you keep your feet inside the little blue square and you look at the judges. The jury is who you should be looking at. They are the judges of your trial. They are the finders of fact. You talk to the jury. You make sure they're understanding. I'm not wearing gloves here now, but when you're examining all of these items. Did he just make a crack about not wearing gloves? Yes, sir. Does Megan Fletcher, did she wear gloves? Yes, sir. Why? Uh, to make sure we're not contaminating it as well as to protect ourselves from anything that may be on the garment. And as far as the, uh, um, to not contaminate it, you, you don't want to put any of your, anything of you on that garment. Correct. It's a standard practice for us to wear a lab coat, gloves, and if it's going to be processed for DNA later, we also wear a mask. And is that in a controlled environment when you attempt to get these parts? Ah! Yes, sir. Chat. I see you. Thank you, Judge. That's all. Thank you, Judge. That's all. I have no further use for this witness, he says. Oh, I guess they're not retesting any of these. Either that or they're going to retest it and say the council did it. It's just, Rachel, it's just so wild. Oh. So there could be one blade of grass with blood on it that might be in the trash can. Sure, could be. The uh, you said if, you, if you're going to do DNA testing, you wear a mask. Stuff yes, happens, sir. apparently. You wear a mask. Yes, sir, I did. So, to your knowledge, for we have all dressed chips these today. Items we have process for DNA chips. after the GSR processing. It was my understanding that they had the potential for DNA analysis. Yes, sir. Okay. I don't know. Now, the, the seems system. like you can't DNA test it Talk again now that everybody's touched it with their fingers. How you go about sampling for GSR, and you talked about the shirt, and you said you would do the chest and sleeve on either side. Um, how does that work? Do you lay the shirt out on a table? Yes, sir. So um, as I stated, the table is thoroughly cleaned, and then we place down parchment paper as well, um, sterile parchment paper, and lay the garment out on that so that we can access all the areas. And for the 
chart here, I think it's item 19. Did did you just uh, they can check on the two areas at the top on the chest? Side yes, sir. Unless we're given information from the investigative team or from an officer who submitted it that there's potentially a reason to test somewhere else, we only test the chest and sleeve area because that's the area that would be closest to the discharge of a firearm. And that's what you're looking for is, do you call it gunshot residue, is that right? Yes, sir. It's microscopic, so you cannot see it. Therefore, we're testing the areas where we would expect to find it. And you would expect to find she didn't do the testing she did the list on on the shoulders of a person who had recently shot a gun i would take it yes sir that's what you're looking for that's what we're trying to find out yes right and then you did um some gsr testing of a seat belt assembly and buckle and whatnot correct correct okay and uh, you did gsr testing of this rain jacket here right paging Correct. law and lumber and paging law and lumber shirt the chat would like a proof shorts, that you have not shoes, actually lost your mind and, over this and officer <laughs> barnado i think is his name uh you you receive a sample from him and you just check to be sure it, it was off i didn't physically hands. receive it from him but he was the collecting officer listed on the sheet yes sir okay and um and, and so he would have somewhere. taken what do you the call sample, your Alexa or whoever that set it off. did it, would have taken That's it from funny. Mr. Murdoch. And that would be item number 18, I believe. Slide item 18, yes, sir. And, and those are um, the samples taken from Mr. Murdoch's hands, I take it? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, yes, Jeff now, Fertie, motion granted. It's 5 p.m. somewhere. gunshot residue on you. Um, by just simply picking up a firearm, can you not? Those questions would be, be better asked of the analyst. I can only testify to that factually what I did. Okay. And the She's analyst here not is the Ms. analyst. Fletcher? Yes, sir. Okay. She's not the analyst. That's a good answer. I'm the court. I'm the technician. I lifted the evidence. Well, let me ask you. I made my you notes. Take a look. At this chain of custody has a lot going on. Your worksheet, which is in evidence, 423. Christy, trust me, if we could find them in Lebanon, and, Tennessee, uh, I would drive there to get them because I am near Franklin. Do you have that up there? Yes, sir. You know, I, 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 I just, have them sent by. I think I'd rather put it on the Elmo. Great. So, put it on the Elmo. Do you have it in? I have my copy. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So um, It's 5 o'clock on the east. I hope we're almost done with this witness, and this will be the end of today. The person who actually did the GSR testing the analyst will be in. She is the technician who did the lifting and all of the things. All right. Um, yeah, go to the top. Okay, let's stop right there. Um, I mean, Agent Hall, it, it says that this was a brand Haynes beefy T-shirt. Yes, sir. And and then um, particle lifts, right sleeve, right chest, left sleeve, left chest. Correct. Correct. And it right um, says description paper bag containing one white t-shirt is that right that's correct and if you, and doug if you'll go up down a little bit more doug, up, okay down, and then all around and then there it says comments small reddish brown stains observed <coughs> shirt had odor of laundry detergent is what it says correct correct do you know what those small reddish brown stains looked like smart they looked like small reddish brown stains on the shirt <laughs> were, were they tested i have no knowledge of what was done after i handled the object okay now now below here it says sealed brown paper bag containing one pair of green shorts that was smart is that just a entry for another item Yes, sir, that's item number 20. The, um, the sheet is designed where we can put two items on one sheet. They're okay. trying to bait the prosecution so into when you that one better expert that's a mouse. The shirt, mouse. item 19, was it in its own separate bag? In this case, it was, yes, sir. That's why I made the note that that individual item contained its own brown paper bag, while the description says oh, brown paper bag Rebecca, containing. Rebecca, I'm sorry. My friends and I joke and about it being Lebanon the versus Lebanon. It, Those are sorry. green cargo shorts. And, in, and again, sort you, of inside joke. You, you lifted, it says right growing, left growing. Correct. And, and it's 
I mean, it's just on the, is it on the inside of the pants leg or? It, well, it's on the outside of the garment, um, uh, down to, you know, a reasonable distance, uh, depending on the type of fabric could depend on how much adhesive it has, um, depending on how large the garment is for the, from the person, a small garment versus a 3XL is completely right. different. It depends on how far I can, can go down on the garment. And, and then, and to do this, you take a, a sticky something or another? And it's just... a double-sided adhesive on an aluminum stub um, within those little vials. Uh, the bottom has a holder for that, and then we just use, we grip it by the bottom and repeatedly dab it across the garment. Until it loses its, its stickiness? Correct. And then, do, do you do one vial per area or multiple vials? It's one vial per area listed. If for some reason I needed to use an extra vial or an additional vial, that would have had its own um, listing on the worksheet. Okay. I'm trying, Rob. I'm trying. I was reading the chat. Now, I tell you, you don't know what the results no. of, of your lifting were, do you? No, sir, Everything's now been touched but with fingers. It can't be retested, which is a problem. Finish your work and send it up the chain. Yes, sir. All the items are either given directly to the analyst or they're securely stored in the trace evidence lab until the analyst takes possession of them. Okay. If anybody wanted to retest this, it's and, not going to be retested. It's all now on the rain jacket. You said you, you put carbon on it or something? Uh, yes, sir. It's a standard practice for anything collected from an inanimate or object. Um, we typically get um, a lot of debris, um, sand, dirt, or fibers um, typically from clothing. The trash, and that can cause it to be a little bit more difficult on the instrument for them to get pictures of the particles. So the carbon just allows them to get a better picture of the carbon, I mean, excuse me, a better picture of the particles when they do their analysis. But it does not do anything to add or remove GSR. So you put the carbon down before you use your sticky thing? No, sir, that process happens after the collection. Okay. So cool. it goes into a small um, device and there's little rods of carbon that are rubbed against each other inside of the instrument to put the layer of carbon onto it. I see. Jim's smart. But you're not putting carbon on the garment. No, sir. Jim's making this seem like it's real complicated and he's like, or something here or something there. He doesn't want this to seem simple. This is really confusing, sciencey, sciencey stuff that's confusing. So he's trying to, um, he's trying to make it seem like I'm this is here. complex or complicated or too much for the jury to understand. It's, you don't understand. It's, it's, it's all too complex. We're just, we're just simple. That's kind of the direction Jim's going in. It, I don't know if it'll play with this jury, especially with a heavily female Ms. jury. Are you involved in they any, could find it very demeaning. DNA process. Like all this is so complex. Okay. And so you don't know whether any of the items were processed for DNA. I have no knowledge of where the items went after they left my department. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. You may step down. Can somebody tell counsel to put gloves on? Because I'm losing my mind. I think we're done for the day. It is 5.15 in the east. I think this was our last witness for the day. We will see. Ladies and gentlemen. Unless you have a two-minute witness, this will be it for today. We don't, Your Honor. I heard the jury kind of laugh. Ladies and gentlemen, that will do it for this day. We will resume at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Please do not discuss the case. Today was a lot. Um, I don't know if we'll be all the way done or if they will have anything to say to the, um, if they will have anything else to say to the attorneys. But the jury is exiting the room. They will be back at 9.30 tomorrow morning because the 404 hearings are done. The court's ruled on that this morning. We'll do that in a summary. I'm going to wait and see if we get back to court at all, if the judge has anything to say, if the attorneys have anything to say. Um, so we're just going to wait a minute and see. I'm going to turn the, there we go, back to the court. Um, we'll see if we get any see volume. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Harpudian, concerning the item that you were objecting to the testing, yes. I think it was, a, was that the the blue, what, what exhibit number is that? Uh, it's just the rain jacket, Your Honor. Not the 
sh uh, T-shirt, not the shorts, not the shoes. And regarding that same... Um, just the one with the bunch of GSR on it, Your Honor, just that It's the same item that Mr. Griffin cross-examined a previous witness concerning? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Examined her extensively about whether she'd ever, first of all, was that rain jacket in his hands when he came in that morning? Two, had she ever seen him with that rain jacket? And three, um, um, did she, I mean, when she looked into the closet, did she know whether it was a tarp or whether it was a rain jacket? Was it the same color? She said it was the same color. That's it. And I objected to it because I thought the prejudicial outweighed the probity. I hate it when they cut the audio, but they cut the audio frequently in this case more so than they did in Deputy Heard. Um, in Deputy Heard, the courtroom was a little more set up for the attorneys to um, and the court to control their own sound. So the court is talking to his judicial assistant. So I also recall Mr. Research attorney. Griffin questioned her as to whether it appeared there was a gun or different things in it. No, no, Your Honor. I question her no, as to the tarp. This witness, Ms. Shelley Smith, has never, they never showed her the rain jacket. She's never identified a rain jacket. And when asking court here a photo of that rain jacket, she says, Your Honor, that is not what he had. And what's so prejudicial is they have introduced GSR, they, and they will introduce an expert tomorrow to say it's covered with GSR. And, and that is extremely prejudicial. They have no evidence connecting Mr. Murdoch to that rain jacket. And, and the only witness they relied upon to get a search warrant, Your Honor, says that he came in with a tarp. You I questioned her whether the in the warrant. tarp, it looked like there was a gun in the tarp. She says no. Um, she says he went upstairs, he came down, he laid the tarp op open on his mother's retirement rocking chair. And she leaves that day and she sees the tarp laid out and it's a tarp that looks like it goes over a car and now they're coming in showed her a, a photo of something in the closet that they seized and says yeah does that look like a tarp and, i mean does that look like what you saw and she, she said, well, said yes and now they're putting in gsr on an item in a house he doesn't live in on an item he's never had in his possession to the best of anybody's knowledge and that that's the basis of our objection your honor or, um, you could have suppressed the so search honor, warrant. Again, <clears throat> if you look at the testimony, <clears throat> excuse me, in its entirety, uh, Ms. Smith described. Um, yes, give Creighton a minute to grab a little bit of water. And yes, he did misstate the testimony, but that's on Creighton. Uh, she testified, of course, that uh, Alec Murdoch had showed up early in the morning, which was highly unusual. He was carrying what appeared to be a blue tarp balled up. Uh, and then she was shown the picture in the closet where it's balled up and said, that looks like the item. Now, when it was pulled out and shown by them, she said, that's not what <clears throat> necessarily I saw, but she did recognize the balled up item and the balled up item in the closet, which the investigator said that's how they recovered it. She did identify that picture. And then if you put the two uh, chains of evidence together, that's what the investigator recovered that she identified. Now, certainly they can argue to the jury whether or not that's the right tarp or not, but she did say that that is consistent with what I saw all balled up, which was the only way she saw it. Uh, again, this is also evidence that you know was admitted and has been extensively this is examined for the evidence jury on. For so the certainly defense. they can argue all these points to the jury, but there's enough of a chain that's been established uh, by the testimony for it to be submitted to the jury. Your Honor, might I make a suggestion? Yes, sir. We're getting daily transcripts. Perhaps overnight, you could before they. I mean, the, the, the prejudicial piece is he wants to the stall the judge from ruling tomorrow, against I would them. Suggest. Uh, perhaps you could look at that daily transcript of her testimony alone. And I don't believe, I submit, <laughs> she said what he said, maybe what he wished she said. I don't believe he said, she said what he, he um, said. Um, Your Honor. Are you um, saying I he missed it? Waters is arguing this. I don't believe Mr. Meadows has a dog in this. Y'all just did. <laughs> well, <laughs> good, for the, good, good for the gander, but um, 520, I just thought maybe this is a simple solution. He's going to say this is what she said. We're going to say this is what she said. I think it's clear she never said that what was in the closet with what he came he carried in. But and of course you have a court reporter that could 
I guess not type it tonight, but perhaps give you an audio of it. But it's a very simple question. It boils down to what she said about what she saw in the closet. Because clearly she said that when, when shown a picture, that's not what he walked in with. He walked in with a tarp, um, which he left over a chair. Um, and, you know, other than their supposition that he somehow brought that rain jacket in, uh, and wadded it up and threw it Jim, up in the closet. Jim, this is exact, Dick, this is what Jim no said. No evidence that there was a gun, no evidence that anything was balled up in it. They'd want to make a giant leap of logic. If this, I mean, it's not circumstantial evidence of anything. So I, I would it's ask not? the court to perhaps look at the daily transcript. Somebody's got one right there. Um, and just look <laughs> at her testimony, not all of it, just her <laughs> or even a piece of her testimony. What did she see in the closet in response to Mr. Matter's question? She you know, identified Mr. the Mr. Matter's belief she said something, and Mr. Waters believes this she said something different. This is all argument for the jury. Said. The proof is in the pudding, as they say, or whatever. Uh, that's not really a legal aphorism there, but um, I would suggest strongly that maybe you overnight look at it. And He's hoping to you stall say. the judge, and that's not going to happen. Mr. Matters, you had uh, something? Mr. Waters, yeah. I think, and I guess the, the, on redirect through their investigator's transcript, I think they were asked, when I asked her if they had asked her about whether it could contain a firearm, and she said, well, I don't know. But that was brought out, I think, which would uh, was. directly from their investigators who asked her about it. Um, it was. So that, I think, made it relevant. Uh, they certainly thought it was relevant when they were interviewing her. Um, so that's why we do well, think it's relevant. Well, that's not a good we, argument, we hope counsel. Let us keep going tomorrow with the GSR to see if there's anything potentially in the rain jacket that has GSR in it. All right. Okay, we'll adjourn for this day. The judge did not give them a ruling. They're going to argue this again tomorrow. The defense is objecting as much as they can object to this raincoat. I understand why that witness was not tremendously clear, and I think the defense is right to argue it. Is it frustrating as hell to watch? Oh, they're still in court, so I'm going to just... Um, put this up. Is it really annoying to watch? Yes. Does the defense have to fight this? Yes, they do. Um, uh, Sheriff Fabulous Glasses was just talking to Buster. I don't, it, it, it's very, very interesting to see um, what pieces of evidence the defense is fighting over. It was fighting to keep the financial crimes out, and now we know they're coming in, and it's fighting to keep the raincoat slash tarp out, and now we are seeing that the judge might not do that either. Um, I think the judge will probably let it in, but I think the defense has made some really good arguments that this witness, uh, Shelly Smith, did not connect it directly, but she said it looked like a tarp. It was all balled up, and so they get out the tarp and they ball it up and they're like like this but then the female prosecutor gets out the jacket with a different witness and balls it up and is like like this so i think there's room to have a conversation about exactly what the witness saw they showed her a picture she said this is consistent with what i saw and consistent with what i saw is fair because it is tarp like material even if it's not a tarp. It is a big blue rain jacket and a big blue tarp. They look almost the same color blue from the screen here. Wow, wow, wow. It's it's very interesting to see, but I, if the witness was more clear, they wouldn't be fighting over this nearly as much. That's where we're at. So uh, they're still on a feed of watching Alec come out of court, I suppose. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Um, Sheriff Specs also has amazing earrings. Yes. Can they call Shelly back? I think it's a little late for them to call Shelly back. But this, it was disorganized testimony. And that's part of why it's so difficult because the testimony was disorganized. And I think what they got out was that she identified the picture. And with identifying the picture, um, then we get to well, what's in that picture is what was taken out of the closet. What was taken out of the closet isn't, in fact, a tarp. It's a raincoat. But the defense has a good argument here saying, look, how do you connect this raincoat to Alec? Well, the witness says he came in with a tarp back and forth and back and forth. So that's where we're at on that. We'll see 
what the judge says about that tomorrow. I think they're going to argue. They're going to look at their daily transcripts. Uh, the jury doesn't have jail daily transcripts to sort these issues out. The jury is just sitting there going, what happened? But we're going to start getting into the financial crime stuff, I think, tomorrow. We still haven't heard from the medical examiner, which is wild. Um, and I, I'm curious as to where where they are going to go with the rest of this. After Alec goes out of court, they um, handcuff him to walk him to the to walk him to the transport van. So he will be handcuffed to be walked to transport. Um, and then he generally puts his coat over the handcuffs and walks walks out. So he is walking to transport and then somebody is carrying all of his his files. So <sighs> that is uh that is that for today. They are transporting Alec back out of jail uh, or back out of court today, back to custody. It looks like they have quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of folks there to get him transported out. So I'm going to answer some question. Uh, he is he is a really tall guy. I believe the friends of his son said his nickname was Big Red, um, and you can see why. He is a very even in court. You can tell when he stands up how much taller he is. But it also lends so much credence to the attorney that testified this morning that said Alec got up in my space, kind of looking down at me and was and was like, I thought we were friends. And the guy's like, well, we might be friends, but I will burn your house down um, to deal with the Mallory Beach case. And you get a sense of that when you see how tall Alec Murdoch is. So with all of that, I'm going to make sure all of our volumes are off so that the volume doesn't come on and scare the living shit out of me. And we're going to answer some questions and then be done for the day. I am tired. <laughs> I am tired. Emily, ask yourself why it's 630 in the morning. Why is Alex bringing uh, it into his mother's home, a tarp, then taking it upstairs and then opening it and laying it across a retirement chair purpose? It's all strange. I absolutely get it. But the prosecution has to make it make sense for this court and for the jury. It's clear that this is a piece of evidence that the defense very much wants to keep out. Very much. Because they're saying it's not related enough and it's too prejudicial. It's covered in GSR. It has the most GSR of anything else is what we heard in opening statements. The prosecution didn't think this was going to be this much of a fight because they went into opening statements and left a lot out that they thought was going to be a fight. They didn't leave this out. The prosecution talked all about this in their opening, so it's going to be very difficult to their case if it comes in. So let's do an afternoon summary. I don't know what happened this afternoon. <laughs> let's do an afternoon summary. Oh, I don't know. Afternoon summary. Afternoon summary. We got back into foundational evidence on gunshot residue and whether the tarp or the blue raincoat was tested for gunshot residue. We learned from the person who collected the items that there's in fact a tarp and a raincoat. There's both a blue tarp and a blue tarp like raincoat, like a, not like a slicker, like a full, like down to your knees trench poncho thing, not like a to the waist zip up, like a pull over rain shield thing. So that happened. Um, we also got into the person who did all of the lifts for the gunshot residue. We have not gotten to the analyst for the gunshot residue. We had very briefly a witness from Bank of America for foundation for records. Could they have all done that by stipulation? Yes. Do I think the defense is stipulating to anything in this case? No. So does the prosecution have to lay all this foundation? Yes. But then we've also got, you know, uh, prosecutor prosecutor my cousin Vinny up there touching all of the evidence with his bare fingers and it just made me lose my mind like it just made me lose my mind today I can't I can't even and he was they were taking out the shoes that were Alec Murdoch's shoes and he was like what is this in the paper where the shoes were and she's like yard debris and he's talking to the court and he's like can we just dump this out in the trash I'm like take the shoes out of the paper show the jury the shoes put the shoes back in the paper close it back up and put it back in the box, leave the debris there. And then he's literally dumping it out in the trash can in the courtroom. I have never seen, I have never seen anything quite like this. I am, you know, every live trial we cover um, has new and interesting things to learn. And, uh, and we have, we have all seen some shit today. I am kind of, I'm still at a loss for words with that. 
just what? What? Can, Your Honor, can we just throw the yard debris away in the trash in the courtroom with his back to the jury? Just, just tossing it. It looks like the prosecution doesn't give a fuck about this case being prosecuted well or above board, and it could sit very poorly with the jury. It just looks sloppy. It looks, and the, again, you know the defense. The prosecution knows that the defense is arguing sloppy investigation, rush to judgment that this attorney general's office just zeroed in on Alec Murdoch and they are gonna pin anything on him that they can. And now they have to be careful that they don't prove the defense right. They are bringing in the financial crimes. I think legally they're allowed to, but they need to make sure that they are not showing the jury that they are sloppy, that they are not doubling down on being everything the defense says that they are. And I think when you're in court without gloves on going, your honor, can we just throw this away? Sure, just dump out the dirt out of the evidence bag. It looks fucking sloppy. It looks like they don't care. It looks like they just think Alec did it. We're the state and we can prove it. It's it's just wild to me to see. It looks like they're not taking this murder trial very seriously at all. And it's wild. It's absolutely wild to witness it happening in court. It feels, I don't know. I don't know how the jury will take it. I don't know how the jury will receive that. But I know all of us sitting here watching, and we had over 30,000 people at this point watching going, <gasps> ugh. And so if there's 30,000 of us sitting here looking gross, then how is the jury going to feel? And if the defense is arguing that the prosecution is shoehorning this murder prosecution with all the financial crimes, and they just don't even care really about the murder prosecution, they're like, fuck Alec Murdoch, we'll just, we'll just prosecute him for this too. The defense is going to have an argument in front of this jury to say, look, they've proved all this financial stuff and that may or not be, but that doesn't prove that he murdered his wife and child. And that might very much resonate with the jury. They've got a long way to go after what we've seen today. And they had some powerful testimony today that got absolutely overshadowed by the fuckery in the afternoon. The witness Today, Shelly Smith said that Alec asked her to say, if anyone asks if I was here, tell him I was here 30 to 40 minutes. That's powerful testimony. But it gets completely overshadowed by just dumping shit in the trash out of the evidence paper. Completely overshadowed. Completely overshadowed. Completely. And, and that is almost forgotten. And that was the main point of today. Because Alec's behavior of asking the witness you know, say I was here for this long and then bringing up where the witness worked, that he was friends with her boss, that he knew she had a wedding coming up, that he could take care of that because weddings are expensive to the point that she was so uncomfortable. She called her brother in law enforcement to talk about it with him. But then the prosecution never said, why were you so uncomfortable? What did you think was going on? Never followed up with that. You called your brother in law enforcement because this made you uncomfortable. What was uncomfortable about it? They never even asked her. Didn't even give her the courtesy of asking her to explain why. I don't know if they didn't think it was important or if they didn't realize what a powerful witness she was, but they didn't ask. So she didn't get to tell the jury how uncomfortable Alec Murdoch's statement to her made her. That's important because she cared for this family. She clearly cared for Alex's mother and father very much. You could hear it in her voice when she talked about Alex's father dying and how sad she is that this has happened to this family. But they didn't let her explain. And I think that is going to hurt the prosecution. I think that will absolutely hurt the prosecution. So I just think that this is kind of stunning. I'm kind of flabbergasted today and I'm I'm just I'm just stunned. I think that was possibly one of their best witnesses. Someone who knew the family clearly doesn't have an axe to grind cuz when Creighton questions people, he comes off as pissed at Alec, which when you're a prosecutor can feel way too heavy-handed for most citizens. 
Most citizens are like, whoa, could you back on up there, buddy? You've got the power of the state behind you. Let's not just be prosecuting people because you don't like them. That feels like overreaching and it's not good. But you have a witness that cared about this family who had a lot of compassion, who had an ick moment when it seems like she was asked to lie. And they didn't lean in and let her explain because they were so busy moving too fast to get into the financial crimes is my opinion. They cannot use the financial crimes to prosecute him for murder. They can use it to explain. But if they use the financial crimes as the, see, this is the reason he's a murderer, it will, if he's convicted, it makes it much easier to get overturned on appeal. I'm just fucking flabbergasted with all of it. That's my summary for today. I'm flabbergasted. If they just wanted to prosecute him for the financial crimes, then just do that and don't charge him with murder. <sighs> then just don't charge him with the murders. Just go with the financial crimes. The financial crimes are easier to prove. The financial crimes are much easier trials than this. This is a much more difficult trial. But someone murdered Maggie and Paul Murdaugh, and they deserve a competent investigation and prosecution. And if it's not Alec, then the state shouldn't be overreaching. And if it is Alec, then they should absolutely do what they can to prove that he did it, he did it based on the evidence that they have. It's wild, but I really think this prosecution team seems blinded by the power of the financial cases, which are not this case and cannot be this case. And even if they get a conviction, it, they run the risk of having it overturned if they are not careful. And I wish I could say I trusted this prosecution team to be careful, but I sure don't at this point. I sure don't. I'm flabbergasted. I'm just, at, it, it, we are watching some of the wildest stuff I have ever seen happen in a courtroom. And it just is, it's stunning. Um, it's, it, I don't know. I don't know where this is going to go. I do not know where this is going to go, but we will see. And the reason I think this witness, Shelly Smith, was so important is because they've got a lot of witnesses coming up that have an ax to grind. They have a lot of witnesses coming up that seem pissed at Alec Murdaugh. We saw the attorney today, earlier today, seems pissed at Alec Murdaugh. Of course he is. He's the lawyer representing Mallory Beach's family. Of course he's pissed at Alec Murdaugh. He thought they were friends. But he was willing to burn his house down for his client, the Beach family. And Alec's behavior after the boat case is reprehensible. So that's fair. But that's not this murder case. You're going to see the CFO from PMPED who seems outraged that Alec would do this to the clients of their firm and outraged that he would put her in a position where the integrity of her job was on the line because of his actions. Outraged. But a lot of people seeming mad at Alec is not going to help. Lean in to what the witnesses who aren't mad at Alec Murdoch have to say. The jury's going to find them the most credible. It's not hard. This is, ugh. so I'm, there has been some evidence in this case that is going to be hard for the defense to overcome, but the defense might not overcome it. The prosecution might overcome it on their own by the way that they are presenting this trial, but we will see. If I am being too hard on them, please let me know in the, in the comments and in the chat. If I am being too tough on this prosecution team, please tell me because I am a former prosecutor and I think it's very fair to hold the state to a higher standard. They're the state. They have the power of the government to yeet people out of society and put them in custody forever or to send them to the death penalty, not what they're doing in this case. But they have the power of the state. They have the burden of proof and they have to act right. That is not what we've seen today. And I am just stunned. Stunned. Today was wild. Just, I really do think that they are so blinded by the financial crimes that they cannot see this case clearly. And it will probably not go well for them in the end. All right. I'm going to go through some of the super chats and some of the questions. Uh, we're going to. We're going to take a minute. 
We're gonna take a breath. I need like a snack and a nap and a bath and a yodeling pickle. Cause I, I don't have words y'all. I just, I need a yod, I just, I just. There is good evidence that is not being well presented and I am not in the middle of my, I should be sitting over here. Blah! <laughs> I'm sorry if I scared any of her paw nerds. <sighs> I am so fucking annoyed at the end of today. Rob, can someone please make a timeline and absence of blood make sense? Please. I have no idea of a garden hose getting rid of that much blood evidence. Doesn't make sense. I still have no clue. I, Rob, I did a timeline in quick bits. I don't know when he had time to change into a fresh, fresh laundered shirt. And now the only witness I really want to hear from at this point, I want to hear about the sussy conversation that happened with the lawyers that we don't know the context of. And I really want to hear from Blanca, who was at the house and made dinner. How long was Blanca at the house? When did Blanca leave? Was Blanca still at the house when Paul left for his mom's house? I have a whole lot of questions. I have a whole lot of questions. And you have a whole lot of questions too, so. Yeah, it's just, it's time for questions. I've got, I think I put my eye of questions mug back in the kitchen. I have so many questions. I have so many questions. Um, so Steph said, your critiques are fair in my opinion. Um, thank you so much. I look, I try not to rage on the attorneys. I try to give them the benefit of the doubt, but uh, I'm a cash said, just rewatched her testimony. She said it was a blue tarp and that you would put it over a car. She did. The prosecution was leading, they were, and she said it was what was in the closet looked like it. Then the defense, she said she was 100% sure it was a tarp, not a raincoat. Yes, I remember all of that too. And then I think on recross, they verify with her, the thing in the picture looked like it. And the thing in the picture is in fact a raincoat. And I think that's what's difficult. But I think you're absolutely right. Um, and they're going to argue that tomorrow. Prosecutors need to study your streams post-trial. They probably don't. They would. They would say... This group of prosecutors would probably say, I am not from South Carolina. I am not. I do not practice in this jurisdiction. I do not. Um, I haven't done as many of trials as they have, but I would challenge that because I've got questions because their trial demeanor is, some of them is different uh, to me. But again, I've got questions. And what else? Oh, and then I'm a commentator. You know, somebody would probably deign to call me a YouTube attorney. Someone else would be put off by my purple hair. So no, they don't need to watch my stream but I think they're too close to the case. And I hope they have someone in their office that is not super close to this case to help them back up and get an overview. They have too much information. And sometimes that makes it hard to clearly see the case you're actually presenting to the jury, not the case in your brain because you know all the things. And this is where having other attorneys from their office that don't know this case as well, monitoring this case to give them feedback is more appropriate really than my feedback. My feedback's just for y'all and to be like, what is even happening here today? Cause I don't know. I'm still reeling about handling the shoes from the crime scene and then touching his face and glass. Yes. And then touching the raincoat and then being like, oh, there's stuff on it. Yes. There's chemicals all over it because they did LCV on it council. And then he gets into the witness about how important it is to wear gloves while he's walking around with his lunch fingers all over everything. I know how. As a juror, can I decide that the case need to go to trial again instead of guilt or not guilt? No. Jurors get to decide guilt or not guilt. That is it. Or they can hang. I mean, they can decide not to decide. Prosecution can't see the forest through the trees. Today, it really feels like that. MaybI'll be interested in what others have to say about it. But it, I'm really, I'm here looking for a good trial so that we understand the evidence because I still have questions. I am not um, really on one side or the other because the only thing I know for sure is that Alec Murdaugh is a shit attorney that stole from a lot of his clients staged a roadside killing of himself for some reason and stole money from his law firm. Those are the things I know. I did not come into this case believing I had answers on this murder case. I came into this trial thinking, what evidence do they have? I'm very curious what they presented to the grand jury and I'm curious to see how this goes. So I'm looking for a through line from the prosecution and 
I am not there yet. And where I'm sitting is, I think the timing is too close for him not to be involved. But you have not convinced me that this man has pulled the trigger. Um, what are the chances the jury is made up of people tied, uh, tired of being terrorized by 100 years of the Murdoch family and just find them guilty? Always a chance. Always a chance. And if the defense was worried about that, they could have moved this prosecution. But we've heard time and time again from folks that this is a good family. And we've heard these witnesses come in knowing the things that we know, saying this is a good family. So it's just as likely that you've got jurors on there that agree with those witnesses and say this is a good family and what's happened to them is awful. And these the prosecution's overreaching. Do you think the lawyer from this morning will be the last witness, maybe like the bomb drop moment? I hope not because that's... Uh, oh, the last attorney, the one who didn't have any ax to grind. I don't know, maybe. They're going to have to decide who their last witness is carefully. I wonder if they'll end with the coroner. Um, did Bubba kill the chicken guinea hen? That Bubba was the one with the bird in his mouth. I feel like Bubba's on trial this today. They were talking about who was a good dog and who was not a good dog. And I was so confused. They're like, does do is Bubba is Bubba is Bubba a difficult dog? What the fuck? We're with the questions about the dog. I was so, oh, I got so confused. Was the raincoat wrapped up in a crumpled tarp? They've got to, the state's got to show that it's connected somehow. Lisa said, found you during Depp v. Heard. <laughs> You're my go-to for trial coverage. Love your commentary. Thank you. All the way in New Zealand, roll on to 7K. I would love to hit 7K, um, 700K in this, you know, YouTube subscribers. Why? Because, you know, I'm still on a mission to prove to my kids that I am, in fact, a real YouTuber. I mean, truly, that's that's where that's where all of that goes to. And my youngest has assured me that until there is an M after the number on my counter, like, you know, Mr. Beast or or Technoblade who never dies, that I am not a real YouTuber. So that that um, Christy said South Texan here. Who do we ask to find out what laundry, laundry detergent still smells good after hours in a hot Southern June humidity and rain? This is a very fair question. Excuse me, what detergent did it smell like where the shirt still smelled good after being in an evidence locker for two days? <laughs> Can we know. Is it detergent? Is it is it is it dryer sheets? What is it? Because it, clearly the shirt still smelled freshly laundered. However. If Blanca testifies, they better ask. They better ask. If Blanca testifies, they better ask if Blanca ever does laundry at the house. Because I imagine that Blanca does do laundry at the house. And if so, then they that's where they need to ask. I need to know. I need to know too. Could the detail on GSR make the jury more interested being everyone is true crime junkies these days? Maybe. But we haven't even gotten to an answer on the GSR yet. So it's just it's just wild. Um, it was bleach smell. I think if it was bleach, they would say it was bleach for sure. Um, the chats, the chats giving, um, the chats giving suggestions chat. We're here for the suggestions. Wasn't the tarp inside a tote storage container inside a closet and the raincoat bunched up in a coat closet? Yes. The tarp, it sounded like was found in a bin, but the bin was, when did they do the search warrant? They did the search warrant 10 days after the witness mentioned it because this all happened in June. The witness didn't mention it till September and they went and served the search warrant. And I'm so annoyed that the prosecution didn't ask the date. Why look like you're hiding something? The search warrant was served on September 16th. So he might've, he might've folded up the tarp and put it in there. Cause the next day it was like out and then it got folded up and put away. I don't know. So I don't know. So it was September 11th was the day she mentioned it to police. September 16th is the day that the search warrant was served at the mother's house. And the defense could have fought to suppress the search warrant. Anything got out of the search warrant. They could have done that too. I don't know if they did. We haven't seen every motion in this case publicly. May, Emily, do you think the prosecution is aware that their timeline is poorly presented? They should, they should be aware, but I don't know if they are. Um, somebody on that team should be like, do we think we're making this clear? No. So if we can't keep up, how will the jury, the jury is at some point going to check out and just wait until somebody explains it to them. Cause it's so much info and it's not clearly presented. And they haven't done a lot of, um, they haven't done a lot of exhibits 
exhibities to help summarize it at all, at all, at all. Haley, this was the judge's entire vibe this afternoon. This was the judge's entire vibe this afternoon. Why isn't anybody ready? That was the judge's whole vibe when he was like, people, your next witness, please. Suggestion, if you want to watch the stream with better audio and have captions, Mac OS has live captions, Apple Silicon only, or Chrome has it built in. I have live captioning on my computer. It doesn't show up through StreamYard, and I haven't been able to figure out why. So if I can figure that out, I will switch it up. The lady attorney needs to take over. There have been times, though, that she was a, a little, uh, well, she was going through all of the foundational evidence, and she did go through all the foundational evidence, and that got a little slow. But yes, she has asked the most open-ended questions. So that has been helpful. Is there a psychologist anywhere on the witness list? I have no idea. I haven't looked. But the defense the defense has a whole bunch of witnesses and experts that are going to poke holes in the prosecution's case, and it's easier to poke holes when the prosecution is disorganized. Is this a fair trial so far? Even when guilty, it should be fair, right? And handled correctly? Yes. This all seems very unprofessional to me. I'm not from the U.S., so I would like to understand. This trial has been a little wild for me, too, but I don't practice in this jurisdiction. Um, I haven't seen anything that's unfair. I, I think the prosecution has done um, not easy, but I think the process not presented things easily, but that doesn't mean it's unfair. The prosecution is making the case harder for themselves to prove. Um, so it is not organized. It is not organized at all. I love that I'm getting super chatted to check on Lawn Lumber. He seems to have reactivated in the chat. So proof of life. Have any of these attorneys watched a single cop show on TV because between the questions they are asking and the handling of evidence, they should know how to question, but the attorney general's office, I don't know how many criminal cases they do. Um, I never allowed anything to be trashed when I used to do QA, uh, QC data collection, diagnostics, and forensic study on the state. Issue DBT cards. This is unacceptable for evidence handling in a murder trial. I don't disagree with you, spicy raccoon. It's wild. EDB, do you know about coffee crisp chocolate bars? Yes, they're amazing. And yes, I love them. And yes, when I am somewhere where I can get them, I bring them home. And the Lawnards from Canada have been generous enough to send a number of of coffee crisps. I think they are fantastic. Canada has superior snacks. They have great snacks. We need some of the Canadian snacks. Why aren't the snacks just universally available? Look, why ruffles? I need to start a Twitter campaign because that's apparently the only way to get things done. Why are these Canada only? They're so good. The US would like all dressed chips, please. We love a good snack. Can we get a better snacky snack down here, please? Thank you. Our neighbors to the north have the better Cadbury chocolate. They have better candy and better snacky snacks. Way better snacky snacks. So anyway, we love it. Canadian snacks. Yes, stacks of Canadian snacks. And I'm not talking about hockey players. Chat, I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Europe would like all dressed too. Yes, please. We would like all dressed chips. <laughs> we would like all dressed chips. Anyway, Chad, I am just, I am blown away with today. Um, but you know what I've got to do? I've got to go get my kiddo off of the bus. So I'm going to go do that right now. I appreciate all of you for being here. Thank you for hanging with me after this trial was over today. We will be back at the same bat time, same bat channel tomorrow, 825-ish. Ish. <laughs> it's always my goal to start the stream on time. I don't always succeed in that goal, but it is always my try. It is. I always try. I always try to start on time. So I will be here tomorrow morning and we'll see what tomorrow brings. Today was wild. Oh, and I have seen the news that Tom Jordy has been released on bond. So he is, he is out of custody and we will see what motions the defense brings. Girardi is the topic of the podcast Wednesday. If you have not gone over to my quick bits channel yet, just put quick bits in YouTube. That is, is where my timeline and my summary lives. It's over on the QuickBits channel. If you want to subscribe over there, you can, but that's where I'm putting my weekly updates. And when I do reels at the end of the day, I put them up there. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to wrap my head around today, but I'm sure going to try. And with that, a huge thank you to our moderators. A thank you to the chat for being law nerds through and through. Today was frustrating and we got through it with no name calling, no diagnosing. The attorneys 
and and just staying as law nerds. And I appreciate you so much for that. So with that, it is time to roll the outro and say goodbye until tomorrow. Goodbye until tomorrow. You can find all the Law Nerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. Connect with me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts, The Emily Show and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the Quick Bits. <laughs>